Section zero of Pescendi Dominici Gregis on the Errors of the Modernists. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Algie Pug. Pescendi Dominici Gregis on the Errors of the Modernists by Pope St. Pius X, translated by Thomas E. Judge. Introduction A deplorable and dishonourable tendency, common enough in every age of the history of Christianity, but especially conspicuous at the present hour, leads certain minds to avow loudly their allegiance to the Catholic Church, and to parade their professions of loyalty to her institutions, in order that they may, the more effectively, rend her unity by heresy and schism. They may not all be equally conscious of the drift of their agitation, or of the depth and dangers of their treason. Carried away by their enthusiasm for mistaken methods of reform, held in bondage by their subserviency to false systems of philosophy, viewing history and institutions in the warm glow of sentiment and emotion, instead of in the cold white light of intelligence, they are tossed about by every wind of doctrine, after having cast to the waves the guidance of reason, authority, and tradition. Their books and pamphlets are generally written in a captivating style, because most of their statements derive substance, form, and colour from incandescent imaginations, and are confessedly exempted from conforming to the laws either of inductive or deductive logic. It has been well said that while God, in the beginning, created men in his image, men now create him in their image. The modernist's conception of him, his attributes and our relations to him, are a factitious product, a sort of stromata, to borrow the title of one of Clement of Alexandria's works, formed out of the most heterogeneous philosophical theories. The idea of contingency, associated with the name of Monsieur Boutrois, Herbert Spencer's relativity, Newman's principle of development, Loisy's conotic hypothesis, the pragmatism of Professor James, and Blondel's philosophy of action, are blended together in a manner that recalls the ingredients of the cauldron by which the witches foretold the fortunes of Macbeth in the cave on the blasted heath. But the unifying, controlling and organising principle of their system is to be sought in Kant's teaching concerning the limitations of our reason and the authority of conscience. The following passage, written more than four years ago by the Reverend William Turner, S.T.D., in his History of Philosophy, exactly describes the dependence of modernism on the critical philosophy of Immanuel Kant. Kant's influence on the development of thought in the 19th century can hardly be overestimated. This philosophy is, as it were, the watershed from which streams of thought flow down, in various courses, into modern idealism, agnosticism, and even materialism. To this source may also be traced some of the most noteworthy currents of contemporary religious thought, especially the movement toward non-dogmatic Christianity. For it is not difficult to see, in Kant's assertion of the supremacy of the moral law, the origin of the tendency to regard Christianity more as a system of ethics and less as a system of dogmatic truth. No other German, not even Goethe, has exercised such influence at home and abroad on the current of religious and metaphysical speculation since the publication of his three famous critiques of pure reason, of practical reason, and of judgment as the sage of Königsberg. Endeavouring to reconcile the scepticism or pan-phenomenalism of Hume, who held that we know nothing except phenomena, or our own feelings and states of consciousness, with the dogmatism of Wolf and Leibniz, who taught that there are necessary and immutable elements in our knowledge which transcend our subjective experience, he distinguished between the content and the forms of knowledge. The former he derives from objects 
which are otherwise declared to be unknown and unknowable. The latter are furnished by the senses and the mind. So far as our powers of reason extend, therefore, we never can know real things, but only the modes in which they affect us or the impressions they make on us. We cannot argue from these impressions as effects to the objects that produce them as causes, because the very principle of causality is declared by Kant to be a mere mental form, a means our minds have of unifying and regulating experience, but not a principle constituting and organising the world of objects. What then becomes of religion and morality if we cannot know the existence of God and the freedom and immortality of the soul? They are postulates of the moral law that are guaranteed by the practical reason or by conscience. The starry heavens above and the moral law within, he tells us, always filled him with awe. His ethical system is sublime in its aim, but divorced from a rational and religious basis. It resembles a pyramid standing on its apex. The supremacy of the practical over the pure or speculative reason logically implies the superiority of action over knowledge. The latter is relegated to the position of handmaid to the former. Furthermore, the moral law is an absolute or categorical imperative. It does not depend upon God or any other external authority. The human spirit is free, autonomous or self-governing, not heteronomous or the slave of another's will. How flattering this conception is to human pride! The two theories of the superiority of action to knowledge and of the autonomy of the human spirit have been adopted and professed with little change by the modernists. Nay, more it is in order to compel Christianity to express itself in the forms and terms of Kant's system of philosophy that the modern Ananiases control and distort the great truths of the Trinity, the Incarnation, the resurrection of Christ, the efficacy of the sacraments, and the teaching authority of the Church. It has been said that St. Thomas of Aquin successfully attempted a similar revolution in converting the mind of the Church to an acceptance of the Aristotelian philosophy. Between the two cases there is no parallelism whatever. The physical and metaphysical writings of the Stagirite had been corrupted by Arabian commentators, who had received them from the Syrians and Persians, among whom Athenian philosophers, banished by Justinian in 529, had found refuge. Pantheists, like David of Dinant and Amaury of Chartres, deduced their wild systems of pantheism from such perverted sources, and it was on account of these evil associations that Aristotle's writings were condemned at the Council of Paris in 1210. But about 1260, William of Merbecca, at the request of St. Thomas, and, as it appears, of Urban IV, translated the complete works of Aristotle into Latin. The Aristotle that was condemned was hostile. The Aristotle that was accepted was favourable to the great truths of Christianity, and it was the latter that St. Thomas made a pedagogue unto Christ, and whose system he employed for the purpose of elaborating a philosophy of the Christian religion, which left intact the substance of its dogmas, even as understood by the simplest of the faithful. What parallelism can be drawn, then, between so sane and conservative a reform and reconstruction of theological science and a revolutionary and anarchistic upheaval that denies the authority and infallibility of the Church, the efficacy of the sacraments, reduces Christ to the mere category of noble men, and proclaims his resurrection a hallucination of the fancy. The relation of modernists and pragmatists to the church is analogous to that of Protagoras to Plato. They are the modern sophists. They teach that man is the measure of all things, that motion and change are universal, that nothing known to the human mind is fixed, static, eternal. But the church proclaims the reality of immutable truth, the rights of the sovereignty of God over the mind and conscience, the supernatural vocation of man. In other words, not only the basic principles of all religion and morality, but the very conditions of right and consistent thinking. 
As the years pass, and prejudices disappear, the encyclical of Pius X on the errors of the modernists will come to be regarded as one of the most important documents ever issued by the Holy See in the course of its sublime history. End of Introduction Section 1 of Pescendi Dominici Gregis On the Errors of the Modernists by Pope St. Pius X Translated by Thomas E. Judge This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Encyclical Letter Pescendi Dominici Gregis On the Errors of the Modernists Part 1 The Encyclical of Our Holy Father Pius X on the errors of the modernists to the patriarchs primates archbishops bishops and other local ordinaries in peace and communion with the apostolic see the office divinely committed to us of feeding the lord's flock has especially this duty assigned to it by christ namely to guard with the greatest vigilance the deposit of the faith delivered to the saints rejecting the profane novelties of words and oppositions of knowledge falsely so called. There has never been a time when this watchfulness of the Supreme Pastor was not necessary to the Catholic body, for, owing to the efforts of the enemy of the human race, there have never been lacking men speaking perverse things, Acts, chapter 20, verse 30, vain talkers and seducers, Titus, Chapter 1, verse 10, erring and driving into error, Second Timothy, chapter 3, verse 13. Still, it must be confessed that the number of the enemies of the cross of Christ has, in these last days, increased exceedingly, who are striving, by arts entirely new and full of subtlety, to destroy the vital energy of the Church, and, if they can, to overthrow utterly Christ's kingdom itself. Wherefore we may no longer be silent, lest we should seem to fail in our most sacred duty, and lest the kindness that, in the hope of wiser counsels, we have hitherto shown them, should be attributed to forgetfulness of our office. Gravity of the Situation That we make no delay in this matter is rendered necessary especially by the fact that the partisans of error are to be sought not only among the church's open enemies they lie hid a thing to be deeply deplored and feared in her very bosom and heart and are the more mischievous the less conspicuously they appear we allude venerable brethren to many who belong to the catholic laity nay and this is far more lamentable to the ranks of the priesthood itself, who, fanning a love for the church, lacking the firm protection of philosophy and theology, nay, more, thoroughly imbued with the poisonous doctrines taught by the enemies of the church, and lost to all sense of modesty, vaunt themselves as reformers of the church, and, forming more boldly into line of attack, assail all that is most sacred in the work of Christ, not sparing even the person of the Divine Redeemer, whom, with sacrilegious daring, they reduce to a simple mere man. Though they express astonishment themselves, no one can justly be surprised that we number such men among the enemies of the Church, if, leaving out of consideration the internal disposition of soul, of which God alone is the judge, he is acquainted with their tenets, their manner of speech, their conduct. Nor indeed will he err in accounting them the most pernicious of all the adversaries of the church. For, as we have said, they put their designs for her ruin into operation, not from without, but from within. Hence the danger is present almost in the very veins and heart of the church, whose injury is the more certain, the more intimate is their knowledge of her. Moreover, they lay the axe, not to the branches and shoots, but to the very root, that is, to the faith and its deepest fibres. And having struck at this root of immortality, 
they proceed to disseminate poison through the whole tree, so that there is no part of Catholic truth from which they hold their hand, none that they do not strive to corrupt. Further, none is more skilful, none more astute than they, in the employment of a thousand noxious arts. For they double the parts of rationalist and Catholic, and this so craftily that they easily lead the unwary into error. And since audacity is their chief characteristic, there is no conclusion of any kind from which they shrink or which they do not thrust forward with pertinacity and assurance. To this must be added the fact, which indeed is well calculated to deceive souls, that they lead a life of the greatest activity, of assiduous and ardent application to every branch of learning, and that they possess, as a rule, a reputation for the strictest morality. Finally, and this almost destroys all hope of cure, their very doctrines have given such a bent to their minds that they disdain all authority and brook no restraint, and relying upon a false conscience, they attempt to ascribe to a love of truth that which is in reality the result of pride and obstinacy. Once indeed we had hopes of recalling them to a better sense, and, to this end, we, first of all, showed them kindness as our children, then we treated them with severity, and at last we have had recourse, though with great reluctance, to public reproof. But you know, venerable brethren, how fruitless has been our action. They bowed their head for a moment, but it was soon uplifted more arrogantly than ever. If it were a matter which concerned them alone, we might, perhaps, have overlooked it. But the security of the Catholic name is at stake. Wherefore, as to maintain it longer would be a crime, we must now break silence, in order to expose, before the whole Church, in their true colours, those men who have assumed this bad disguise. Division of the Encyclical But since the modernists, as they are commonly and rightly called, employ a very subtle artifice, namely, to present their doctrines without order and systematic arrangement into one whole, scattered and disjointed, one from another, so as to appear to be in doubt and uncertainty, while they are in reality firm and steadfast, it will be of advantage, venerable brethren, to bring their teachings together here into one group, and to point out the connection between them, and thus to pass to an examination of the sources of the errors, and to prescribe remedies for averting the evil. Part 1. Analysis of Modernist Teaching To proceed, in an orderly manner, in this recondite subject, it must first of all be noted that every modernist sustains and comprises within himself many personalities. He is a philosopher, a believer, a theologian, an historian, a critic, an apologist, a reformer. These roles must be clearly distinguished from one another by all who would accurately know their system and thoroughly comprehend the principles and the consequences of their doctrines. Agnosticism, its philosophical foundation. We begin then with the philosopher. Modernists place the foundation of religious philosophy in that doctrine which is usually called agnosticism. According to this teaching, human reason is confined entirely within the field of phenomena, that is to say, to things that are perceptible to the senses, and in the manner in which they are perceptible. It has no right and no power to transgress these limits. Hence, it is incapable of lifting itself up to God, and of recognising his existence, even by means of visible things. From this it is inferred that God can never be the direct object of science, and that, as regards history, he must not be considered as an historical subject. Given these premises, all will readily perceive what becomes of natural theology, of the motives, of credibility, of external revelation. The modernists simply make away with them altogether. They include them in intellectualism, which they call a ridiculous, 
and long ago defunct system. Nor does the fact that the Church has formally condemned these portentous errors exercise the slightest restraint upon them. Yet the Vatican Council has defined, If any one says that the one true God, our Creator and Lord, cannot be known with certainty by the natural light of human reason, by means of the things that are made, let him be anathema. On Revelation, Canon 1. And also, if any one says that it is not possible, or not expedient, that man be taught, through the medium of divine revelation, about God and the worship to be paid him, let him be anathema. On Revelation, Canon 2. And finally, if any one says that divine revelation cannot be made credible by external signs, and that, therefore, men should be drawn to the faith only by their personal internal experience, or by private inspiration, let him be anathema. On Faith, Canon 3. But how the modernists make the transition from agnosticism, which is a state of pure nescience, to scientific and historic atheism, which is a doctrine of positive denial, and, consequently, by what legitimate process of reasoning, starting from ignorance as to whether God has in fact intervened in the history of the human race or not, they proceed, in their explanation of this history, to ignore God altogether, as if he really had not intervened. Let him answer who can. Yet it is a fixed and established principle among them that both science and history must be atheistic, and within their boundaries there is room for nothing but phenomena. God, and all that is divine, are utterly excluded. We shall soon see clearly what, according to this most absurd teaching, must be held touching the most sacred person of Christ, what concerning the mysteries of his life and death, and of his resurrection and ascension into heaven. Vital Immanence However, this agnosticism is only the negative part of the system of the modernists. The positive side of it consists in what they call vital immanence. This is how they advance from one to the other. Religion, whether natural or supernatural, must, like every other fact, admit of some explanation. But when natural theology has been destroyed, the road to revelation closed through the rejection of the arguments of credibility, and all external revelation absolutely denied, it is clear that this explanation will be sought in vain outside man himself. It must, therefore, be looked for in man, and, since religion is a form of life, the explanation must certainly be found in the life of man. Hence, the principle of religious imminence is formulated. Moreover, the first actuation, so to say, of every vital phenomenon and religion as has been said, belongs to this category, is due to a certain necessity or impulsion. But it has its origin, speaking more particularly of life, in a movement of the heart, which movement is called a sentiment. Therefore, since God is the object of religion, we must conclude that faith, which is the basis and the foundation of all religion, consists in a sentiment which originates from a need of the divine. This need of the divine, which is experienced only in special and favourable circumstances, cannot of itself appertain to the domain of consciousness. It is at first latent within the consciousness, or, to borrow a term from modern philosophy, in the subconsciousness, where also its roots lie hidden and undetected. Should anyone ask how it is that this need of the divine which man experiences within himself, grows up into a religion, the modernists reply thus. Science and history, they say, are confined within two limits, the one external, namely the visible world, the other internal, which is consciousness. When one or other of these boundaries has been reached, there can be no further progress, for beyond is the unknowable. In presence of this unknowable, whether it is outside man and beyond the visible world of nature, or lies hidden within the subconsciousness, the need of the divine, 
according to the principles of fideism, excites in the soul with a propensity towards religion a certain special sentiment, without any previous advertence of the mind. And this sentiment possesses, implied within itself both as its own object and as its intrinsic cause, the reality of the divine, and, in a way, unites man with God. It is this sentiment to which modernists give the name of faith, and this it is which they consider the beginning of religion. But we have not yet come to the end of their philosophy, or, to speak more accurately, their folly. For modernism finds in this sentiment not faith only, but with and in faith, as they understand it, revelation, they say, abides. For what more can one require for revelation? Is not that religious sentiment, which is perceptible in the consciousness, revelation, or at least the beginning of revelation? Nay, is not God himself, as he manifests himself to the soul, indistinctly, it is true, in this same religious sense, revelation? And they add, since God is both the object and the cause of faith, this revelation is, at the same time, of God and from God, that is, God is both the revealer and the revealed. Hence, venerable brethren, springs that ridiculous proposition of the modernists that every religion, according to the different aspect under which it is viewed, must be considered as both natural and supernatural. Hence it is that they make consciousness and revelation synonymous. Hence the law, according to which religious consciousness is given as the universal rule, to be put on an equal footing with revelation, and to which all must submit, even the supreme authority of the church, whether in its teaching capacity, or in that of legislator in the province of sacred liturgy or discipline. Deformation of Religious History the consequence. However, in all this process, from which, according to the modernists, faith and revelation spring, one point is to be particularly noted, on account of the historico-critical corollaries which are deduced from it. For the unknowable they talk of does not present itself to faith as something solitary and isolated, but rather in close conjunction with some phenomenon, which, though it belongs to the realm of science and history, yet to some extent oversteps their bounds. Such a phenomenon may be a fact of nature, containing within itself something mysterious, or it may be a man, whose character, actions and words cannot, apparently, be reconciled with the ordinary laws of history. Then faith, attracted by the unknowable, which is united with the phenomenon, possesses itself of the whole phenomenon, and, as it were, permeates it with its own life. From this, two things follow. The first is a sort of transfiguration of the phenomenon, by its elevation above its own true conditions, by which it becomes more adapted to that form of the divine which faith will infuse into it. The second is a kind of disfigurement, which springs from the fact that faith, which has made the phenomenon independent of the circumstances of place and time, attributes to it qualities which it has not. And this is true particularly of the phenomena of the past, and the older they are, the truer it is. From these two principles, the modernists deduce two laws, which, when united with the third, which they have already got from agnosticism, constitute the foundation of historical criticism. We will take an illustration from the person of Christ. In the person of Christ, they say, science and history encounter nothing that is not human. Therefore, in virtue of the first canon deduced from agnosticism, whatever there is in his history suggestive of the divine must be rejected. Then, according to the second canon, the historical person of Christ was transfigured by faith. Therefore, everything that raises it above historical conditions must be removed. Lastly, the third canon, which lays down that the person of Christ has been disfigured by faith, requires that everything should be excluded, deeds and words, and all else that is not in keeping with his character, circumstances and education, 
and with the place and time in which he lived. A strange style of reasoning, truly, but it is modernist criticism. Therefore, the religious sentiment, which, through the agency of vital imminence, emerges from the lurking places of the subconsciousness, is the germ of all religion, and the explanation of everything that has been, or ever will be, in any religion. This sentiment, which was, at first, only rudimentary and almost formless, gradually matured under the influence of that mysterious principle from which it originated, with the progress of human life, of which, as has been said, it is a form. This, then, is the origin of all religion, even supernatural religion. It is only a development of this religious sentiment. Nor is the Catholic religion an exception. It is quite on the level with the rest, for it was engendered by the process of vital imminence, in the consciousness of Christ, who was a man of the choicest nature, whose like has never been, nor will be. Those who hear these audacious, these sacrilegious assertions, are simply shocked. And yet, venerable brethren, these are not merely the foolish babblings of infidels. There are many Catholics, yea, and priests, too, who say these things openly, and they boast that they are going to reform the church by these ravings. There is no question now of the old error, by which a sort of right to the supernatural order was claimed for the human nature. We have gone far beyond that. We have reached the point when it is affirmed that our most holy religion, in the man Christ, as in us, emanated from nature spontaneously and entirely. Than this there is surely nothing more destructive of the whole supernatural order. Wherefore the Vatican Council most justly decreed, if anyone says that man cannot be raised by God to a knowledge and perfection which surpasses nature, but that he can and should, by his own efforts and by a constant development, attain finally to the possession of all truth and all good, let him be anathema. On Revelation, Canon 3. The Origin of Dogmas So far, venerable brethren, there has been no mention of the intellect. Still, it also, according to the teaching of the modernists, has its part in the act of faith, and it is of importance to see how. In that sentiment, of which we have frequently spoken, since sentiment is not knowledge, God indeed presents himself to man, but in a manner so confused and indistinct that he can hardly be perceived by the believer. It is therefore necessary that a ray of light should be cast upon this sentiment so that God may be clearly distinguished and set apart from it. This is the task of the intellect, whose office it is to reflect and to analyse, and by means of which man first transforms into mental pictures the vital phenomena which arise within him, and then expresses them in words. Hence the common saying of modernists, that the religious man must think his faith. The intellect, then, encountering this sentiment, directs itself upon it, and produces in it a work resembling that of a painter who restores and gives new life to a picture that has perished with age. The simile is that of one of the leaders of modernism. The operation of the intellect in this work is a double one. First, by a natural and spontaneous act, it expresses its concept in a simple, ordinary statement. Then, on reflection and deeper consideration, or, as they say, by elaborating its thought, it expresses the idea in secondary propositions, which are derived from the first, but are more defined and distinct. These secondary propositions, if they finally receive the approval of the supreme magisterium of the Church, constitute dogma. Thus we have reached one of the principal points in the modernist's system, namely the origin and nature of dogma. For they place the origin of dogma in those primitive and simple formulas, which, under a certain aspect, are necessary to faith. For revelation, to be truly such, requires the clear manifestation of God in the consciousness. But dogma itself, they apparently hold, 
is contained in the secondary formulas. To ascertain the nature of dogma, we must first find the relation which exists between the religious formulas and the religious sentiment. This will be readily perceived by him who realises that these formulas have no other purpose than to furnish the believer with the means of giving an account of his faith to himself. These formulas, therefore, stand midway between the believer and his faith. In their relation to the faith, they are the inadequate expression of its object, and are usually called symbols. In their relation to the believer, they are mere instruments. Its evolution. Hence, it is quite impossible to maintain that they express absolute truth, for, in so far as they are symbols, they are images of truth, and so must be adapted to the religious sentiment in its relation to man, and, as instruments, they are the vehicles of truth, and must, therefore, in their turn, be adapted to man in his relation to the religious sentiment. But the object of the religious sentiment, since it embraces the absolute, possesses an infinite variety of aspects, of which now one, now another, may present itself. In like manner, he who believes may pass through different phases. Consequently, the formulas too, which we call dogmas, must be subject to these vicissitudes, and are therefore liable to change. Thus the way is open to the intrinsic evolution of dogma. An immense collection of sophisms, this, that ruins and destroys all religion. Dogma is not only able, but ought to evolve and to be changed. This is strongly affirmed by the modernists, and as clearly flows from their principles. For, amongst the chief points of their teaching, is this which they deduce from the principle of vital imminence, that religious formulas, to be really religious, and not merely intellectual speculations, ought to be living, and to live the life of the religious sentiment. This is not to be understood in the sense that these formulas, especially if merely imaginative, were to be made for the religious sentiment. It has no more to do with their origin than with their number or quality. What is necessary is that the religious sentiment, some modification being introduced when needful, should vitally assimilate them. In other words, it is necessary that the primitive formula be accepted and sanctioned by the heart, and similarly, the subsequent work from which spring the secondary formulas must proceed under the guidance of the heart. Hence it comes that these formulas, to be living, should be, and should remain, adapted to the faith and to him who believes. Wherefore, if, for any reason, this adaptation should cease to exist, they lose their first meaning, and accordingly must be changed. And since the character and lot of dogmatic formulas is so precarious, there is no room for surprise that modernists regard them so lightly and in such open disrespect. And so they audaciously charge the church both with taking the wrong road from inability to distinguish the religious and moral sense of formulas from their surface meaning, and with clinging tenaciously and vainly to meaningless formulas whilst religion is allowed to go to ruin. Blind that they are, and leaders of the blind, inflated with a boastful science, since they have reached that pitch of folly where they pervert the eternal concept of truth and the true nature of the religious sentiment. With that new system of theirs, they are seen to be under the sway of a blind and unchecked passion for novelty, thinking not at all of finding some solid foundation of truth, but despising the holy and apostolic traditions, they embrace other vain, futile, uncertain doctrines, condemned by the church, on which, in the height of their vanity, they think they can rest and maintain truth itself. The modernist as believer, individual experience and religious certitude. Thus far, venerable brethren, of the modernist considered as philosopher. Now, if we proceed to consider him as believer, seeking to know how the believer, according to modernism, is differentiated from the philosopher, it must be observed 
that although the philosopher recognizes as the object of faith the divine reality, still this reality is not to be found but in the heart of the believer, as being an object of sentiment and affirmation, and therefore confined within the sphere of phenomena. But as to whether it exists outside that sentiment and affirmation is a matter which in no way concerns the philosopher. For the modernist believer, on the contrary, it is an established and certain fact that the divine reality does really exist in itself and quite independently of the person who believes in it. If you ask on what foundation this assertion of the believer rests, they answer, in the experience of the individual. On this head the modernists differ from the rationalists only to fall into the opinion of the Protestants and pseudo-mystics. This is their manner of putting the question. In the religious sentiment one must recognize a kind of intuition of the heart which puts man in immediate contact with the very reality of God and infuses such a persuasion of God's existence and his action both within and without man as to excel greatly any scientific conviction. They assert, therefore, the existence of a real experience and one of a kind that surpasses all rational experience. If this experience is denied by some, like the rationalists, it arises from the fact that such persons are unwilling to put themselves in the moral state which is necessary to produce it. It is this experience which, when a person acquires it, makes him properly and truly a believer. How far off we are here from Catholic teaching we have already seen in the decree of the Vatican Council. We shall see later how, with such theories, added to the other errors already mentioned, the way is opened wide for atheism. Here it is well to note, at once, that, given this doctrine of experience, united with the other doctrine of symbolism, every religion, even that of paganism, must be held to be true. What is to prevent such experiences from being met with in every religion? In fact, that they are to be found is asserted by not a few. And with what right will modernists deny the truth of an experience affirmed by a follower of Islam? With what right can they claim true experiences for Catholics alone? Indeed, modernists do not deny, but actually admit, some confusedly, others in the most open manner, that all religions are true, that they cannot feel otherwise, is clear. For on what ground, according to their theories, could falsity be predicated of any religion whatsoever? It must certainly be on one of these two, either on account of the falsity of the religious sentiment, or on account of the falsity of the formula pronounced by the mind. Now, the religious sentiment, although it may be more perfect, or less perfect, is always one and the same, and the intellectual formula, in order to be true, has but to respond to the religious sentiment, and to the believer whatever be the intellectual capacity of the latter. In the conflict between different religions, the most that modernists can maintain is that the Catholic has more truth because it is more living and that it deserves, with more reason, the name of Christian, because it corresponds more fully with the origins of Christianity. That these consequences flow from the premises will not seem unnatural to anybody. But what is amazing is that there are Catholics and priests who, we would fain believe, abhor such enormities yet act as if they fully approved of them. For they heap such praise and bestow such public honour on the teachers of these errors as to give rise to the belief that their admiration is not meant merely for the persons who are perhaps not devoid of a certain merit, but rather for the errors which these persons openly profess which they do all in their power to propagate. Religious Experience and Tradition But this doctrine of experience is also under another aspect entirely contrary to Catholic truth. It is extended and applied to tradition as hitherto understood by the Church and destroys it. By the modernists, tradition is understood as a communication to others through preaching by means of the intellectual formula of an original experience. 
To this formula, in addition to its representative value, they attribute a species of suggestive efficacy which acts both in the person who believes to stimulate the religious sentiment should it happen to have grown sluggish and to renew the experience once acquired and in those who do not yet believe to awake for the first time the religious sentiment in them and to produce the experience. In this way is religious experience propagated among the peoples and not merely among contemporaries by preaching but among future generations both by books and by oral transmission from one to another. Sometimes this communication of religious experience takes root and thrives, at other times it withers at once and dies. For the modernists to live is a proof of truth, since for them life and truth are one and the same thing. Hence again it is given to us to infer that all existing religions are equally true, for otherwise they would not live. Faith and Science Having reached this point, venerable brethren, we have sufficient material in hand to enable us to see the relations which modernists establish between faith and science, including history also under the name of science. And in the first place, it is to be held that the object of the one is quite extraneous to and separate from the object of the other. For faith occupies itself solely with something which science declares to be unknowable for it. Hence, each has a separate field assigned to it. Science is entirely concerned with the reality of phenomena, into which faith does not enter at all. Faith, on the contrary, concerns itself with the divine reality which is entirely unknown to science. Thus the conclusion is reached that there can be never any dissension between faith and science, for if each keeps on its own ground, they can never meet and therefore never be in contradiction. And if it be objected that in the visible world there are some things which appertain to faith, such as the human life of Christ, the modernists reply by denying this. For though such things come within the category of phenomena, still, in so far as they are lived by faith, and in the way already described, have been by faith transfigured, and disfigured, they have been removed from the world of sense, and translated to become material for the divine. Hence, should it be further asked whether Christ has wrought real miracles, and made real prophecies, whether he rose truly from the dead, and ascended into heaven, the answer of agnostic science will be in the negative, and the answer of faith in the affirmative. Yet there will not be, on that account, any conflict between them, for it will be denied by the philosopher as philosopher, speaking to philosophers and considering Christ only in his historical reality, and it will be affirmed by the speaker, speaking to believers and considering the life of Christ as lived again by the faith and in the faith. Faith subject to science. Yet it would be a great mistake to suppose that, given these theories, one is authorised to believe that faith and science are independent of one another. On the side of science, the independence is indeed complete, but it is quite different with regard to faith, which is subject to science not on one but on three grounds. For, in the first place, it must be observed that in every religious fact, when you take away the divine reality and the experience of it which the believer possesses, everything else, and especially the religious formulas of it, belongs to the sphere of phenomena, and therefore falls under the control of science. Let the believer leave the world if he will, but so long as he remains in it, he must continue, whether he like it or not, to be subject to the laws, the observation, the judgments of science and of history. Further, when it is said that God is the object of faith alone, the statement refers only to the divine reality, not to the idea of God. The latter also is subject to science, which, while it philosophizes in what is called the logical order, soars also to the absolute and the ideal. It is, therefore, the right of philosophy and of science to form conclusions concerning the idea of God, to direct it in its evolution, and to purify it of any extraneous elements 
which may become confused with it. Finally, man does not suffer a dualism to exist in him, and the believer therefore feels, within him, an impelling need so to harmonize faith with science, that it may never oppose the general conception which science sets forth concerning the universe. Thus it is evident that science is to be entirely independent of faith, while, on the other hand, and notwithstanding that they are supposed to be strangers to each other, faith is made subject to science. All this, venerable brothers, is in formal opposition to the teachings of our predecessor, Pius the Ninth, where he lays it down that, in matters of religion, it is the duty of philosophy not to command, but to serve, not to prescribe what is to be believed, but to embrace what is to be believed with reasonable obedience, not to scrutinize the depths of the mysteries of God, but to venerate them devoutly and humbly. The modernists completely invert the parts, and to them may be applied the words of another predecessor of ours, Gregory the Ninth, addressed to some theologians of his time. Some among you, inflated like bladders with the spirit of vanity, strive by profane novelties to cross the boundaries fixed by the fathers, twisting the sense of the heavenly pages. To the philosophical teaching of the rationals, not for the profit of their hearer, but to make a show of science. These, seduced by strange and eccentric doctrines, make the head of the tail and force the queen to serve the servant. The Methods of Modernists This becomes still clearer to anybody who studies the conduct of modernists, which is in perfect harmony with their teachings. In their writings and addresses, they seem, not unfrequently, to advocate now one doctrine, now another, so that one would be disposed to regard them as vague and doubtful. But there is a reason for this, and it is to be found in their ideas as to the mutual separation of science and faith. Hence, in their books, you will find some things which might well be expressed by a Catholic, but in the next page you will find other things which might have been dictated by a rationalist. When they write history, they make no mention of the divinity of Christ, but when they are in the pulpit, they profess it clearly. Again, when they write history, they pay no heed to the fathers and the councils, but when they catechise the people, they cite them respectfully. In the same way, they draw their distinctions between theological and pastoral exegesis and scientific and historical exegesis. So, too, acting on the principle that science in no way depends upon faith, and when they treat of history, philosophy, criticism, feeling no horror at treading in the footsteps of Luther, they are wont to display a certain contempt for Catholic doctrines, for the Holy Fathers, for the ecumenical councils, for the ecclesiastical magisterium. And should they be rebuked for this, they complain that they are being deprived of their liberty. Lastly, guided by the theory that faith must be subject to science, they continuously and openly criticise the Church because of her sheer obstinacy in refusing to submit and accommodate her dogmas to the opinions of philosophy, while they, on their side, after having blotted out the old theology, endeavour to introduce a new theology which shall follow the vagaries of their philosophers. The Modernist as Theologian, His Principles, Imminence and Symbolism and thus, venerable brethren, the road is open for us to study the modernists in the theological arena, a difficult task, yet one that may be disposed of briefly. The end to be attained is the conciliation of faith with science, always, however, saving the primacy of science over faith. In this branch, the modernist theologian avails himself of exactly the same principles which we have seen employed by the modernist philosopher, and applies them to the believer, the principles of imminence and symbolism. The process is an extremely simple one. The philosopher has declared, the principle of faith is imminent. The believer has added, this principle is God, and the theologian draws the conclusion, God is imminent in man. Thus we have theological imminence. 
so too the philosopher regards as certain that the representations of the object of faith are merely symbolical the believer has affirmed that the object of faith is god in himself and the theologian proceeds to affirm that the representations of the divine reality are symbolical and thus we have theological symbolism truly enormous errors both the pernicious character of which will be seen clearly from an examination of their consequences for to begin with symbolism since symbols are but symbols in regard to their objects and only instruments in regard to the believer it is necessary first of all according to the teachings of the modernists that the believer do not lay too much stress on the formula but avail himself of it only with the scope of uniting himself to the absolute truth which the formula at once reveals and conceals that is to say endeavours to express but without succeeding in doing so they would also have the believer avail himself of the formulas only in so far as they are useful to him for they are given to be a help and not a hindrance with proper regard however for the social respect due to formulas which the public magisterium has deemed suitable for expressing the common consciousness until such time as the same magisterium provide otherwise. Concerning imminence, it is not easy to determine what modernists mean by it, for their own opinions on the subject vary. Some understand it in the sense that God working in man is more intimately present in him than man is in even himself, and this conception, if properly understood, is free from reproach. Others hold that the divine action is one with the action of nature, as the action of the first cause is one with the action of the secondary cause, and this would destroy the supernatural order. Others, finally, explain it in a way which savours of pantheism, and this, in truth, is the sense which tallies best with the rest of their doctrines. With this principle of imminence is connected another which may be called the principle of divine permanence. It differs from the first in much the same way as the private experience differs from the experience transmitted by tradition. An example will illustrate what is meant, and this example is offered by the church and the sacraments. The church and the sacraments, they say, are not to be regarded as having been instituted by Christ himself. This is forbidden by agnosticism, which sees in Christ nothing more than a man whose religious consciousness has been, like that of all men, formed by degrees. It is also forbidden by the law of imminence, which rejects what they call external application. It is further forbidden by the law of evolution, which requires for the development of the germs a certain time and a certain series of circumstances. It is, finally, forbidden by history, which shows that such, in fact, has been the course of things. Still, it is to be held that both church and sacraments have been founded immediately by Christ. But how? In this way. All Christian consciences were, they affirm, in a manner virtually included in the conscience of Christ, as the plant is included in the seed. But as the shoots live the life of the seed, so too all Christians are said to live the life of Christ. For the life of Christ is according to faith, and so too is the life of Christians. And since this life produced, in the course of ages, both the Church and the sacraments, it is quite right to say that their origin is from Christ and is divine. In the same way they prove that the Scriptures and the dogmas are divine. And thus the modernistic theology may be said to be complete. No great thing in truth, but more than enough for the theologian who professes that the conclusion of science must always, and in all things, be respected. The application of these theories to the other points we shall proceed to expound, anyone may easily make for himself. Dogma and the Sacraments Thus far we have spoken of the origin and nature of faith. But as faith has many shoots, and chief among them the church, dogma, worship, the books which we call sacred, of these also we must know what is taught by the modernists. To begin with dogma, we have already indicated its origin and nature. Dogma is born of the species of impulse 
or necessity, by virtue of which the believer is constrained to elaborate his religious thought so as to render it clearer for himself and others. This elaboration consists entirely in the process of penetrating and refining the primitive formula, not indeed in itself, and according to logical development, but as required by circumstances, or vitally, as the modernists more abstrusely put it. Hence it happens that around the primitive formula, secondary formulas gradually continue to be formed, and these subsequently grouped into bodies of doctrine, or into doctrinal constructions, as they prefer to call them, and further sanctioned by the public magisterium as responding to the common consciousness, are called dogma. Dogma is to be carefully distinguished from the speculations of theologians, which, although not alive with the life of dogma, are not without their utility as serving to harmonize religion with science and remove opposition between the two, in such a way as to throw light from without on religion and it may be even to prepare the matter for future dogma. Concerning worship, there would not be much to be said, were it not that under this head are comprised the sacraments, concerning which the modernists fall into the gravest errors. For them, the sacraments are the resultant of a double need. For, as we have seen, everything in their system is explained by inner impulses or necessities. In the present case... The first need is that of giving some sensible manifestation to religion. The second is that of propagating it, which could not be done without some sensible form and consecrating acts, and these are called sacraments. But for the modernists, the sacraments are mere symbols or signs. They are not devoid of a certain efficacy. An efficacy, they tell us, like that of certain phrases vulgarly described as having caught on, inasmuch as they have become the vehicle for the diffusion of certain great ideas which strike the public mind. What the phrases are to the ideas, that the sacraments are to the religious sentiment, that and nothing more. The modernists would be speaking more clearly were they to affirm that the sacraments are instituted solely to foster the faith. But this is condemned by the Council of Trent. If any one say that these sacraments are instituted solely to foster the faith, let him be anathema. The Holy Scriptures We have already touched upon the nature and origin of the sacred books. According to the principles of the modernists, they may be rightly described as a collection of experiences, not indeed of the kind that may come to anybody, but those extraordinary and striking ones which have happened in any religion. And this is precisely what they teach about our books of the Old and New Testament. But to suit their own theories, they note, with remarkable ingenuity, that although experience is something belonging to the present, still it may derive its material from the past and the future alike, inasmuch as the believer, by memory, lives the past over again after the manner of the present, and lives the future already by anticipation. This explains how it is, that the historical and apocalyptic books are included among the sacred writings. God does indeed speak in these books, through the medium of the believer, but only, according to modernistic theology, by vital imminence and permanence. Do we inquire concerning inspiration? Inspiration, they reply, is distinguished only by its vehemence from that impulse which stimulates the believer to reveal the faith that is in him by words or writing. It is something like what happens in poetical inspiration, of which it has been said, There is a God in us, and when he stirreth, he sets us afire. And it is precisely in this sense that God is said to be the origin of the inspiration of the sacred books. The modernists affirm, too, that there is nothing in these books which is not inspired. In this respect, some might be disposed to consider them as more orthodox than certain other modernists who somewhat restrict inspirations, as, for instance, in what have been put forward as tacit citations. But it is all mere juggling of words, for if we take the Bible, according to the tenets of agnosticism, to be a human work, made by men for men, 
but allowing the theologian to proclaim that it is divine by immanence, what room is there left in it for inspiration? General inspiration in the modernist sense, it is easy to find, but of inspiration in the Catholic sense, there is not a trace. End of Part 1 of Encyclical Letter Pescendi Dominici Gregis On the Errors of the Modernists Section 2 of Pescendi Dominici Gregis On the Errors of the Modernists by Pope St. Pius X Translated by Thomas E. Judge This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Encyclical, Part 2 The Church A wider field for comment is opened when you come to treat of the vagaries devised by the modernist school concerning the Church. You must start with the supposition that the Church has its birth in a double need, the need of the individual believer, especially if he has had some original and special experience, to communicate his faith to others, and the need of the Mass, when the faith has become common to many, to form itself into a society, and to guard, increase, and propagate the common good. What, then, is the Church? It is the product of the collective conscience, that is to say, of the society of individual consciences which, by virtue of the principle of vital permanence, all depend on one first believer, who, for Catholics, is Christ. Now, every society needs a directing authority to guide its members towards the common end, to conserve prudently the elements of cohesion, which, in a religious society, are doctrine and worship. Hence the triple authority in the Catholic Church, disciplinary, dogmatic, liturgical. The nature of this authority is to be gathered from its origin, and its rights and duties from its nature. In past times, it was a common error that authority came to the Church from without, that is to say, directly from God, and then it was rightly held to be autocratic. But this conception has now grown obsolete, for in the same way as the Church is a vital emanation, of the collectivity of consciences, so too authority emanates vitally from the Church itself. Authority, therefore, like the Church, has its origin in the religious conscience, and, that being so, is subject to it. Should it disown this dependence, it becomes a tyranny. For we are living in an age when the sense of liberty has reached its fullest development, and when the public conscience has, in the civil order, introduced popular government. Now there are not two consciences in man, any more than there are two lives. It is for the ecclesiastical authority, therefore, to shape itself to democratic forms, unless it wishes to provoke and foment an intestine conflict in the consciences of mankind. The penalty of refusal is disaster, for it is madness to think that the sentiment of liberty, as it is now spread abroad, can surrender. Were it forcibly confined and held in bonds, terrible would be its outburst, sweeping away at once both church and religion. Such is the situation for the modernists, and their one great anxiety is in consequence to find a way of conciliation between the authority of the church and the liberty of believers. The relations between church and state. But it is not with its own members alone that the church must come to an amicable arrangement. Besides its relations with those within it, it has others outside. The church does not occupy the world all by itself. There are other societies in the world with which it must necessarily have contact and relations. The rights and duties of the church towards civil societies must, therefore, be determined, and determined, of course, by its own nature, as the modernists have already described it. The rules to be applied in this matter are those which have been laid down for science and faith, though in the latter case the question is one of objects, while here we have one of ends. 
In the same way, then, as faith and science are strangers to each other by reason of the diversity of their objects, church and state are strangers by reason of the diversity of their ends, that of the church being spiritual, while that of the state is temporal. Formerly it was possible to subordinate the temporal to the spiritual, and to speak of some questions as mixed, allowing to the church the position of queen and mistress in all such, because the church was then regarded as having been instituted immediately by God as the author of the supernatural order. But this doctrine is today repudiated, alike by philosophers and historians. The state must, therefore, be separated from the church and the Catholic from the citizen. Every Catholic, from the fact that he is also a citizen, has the right and the duty to work for the common good in the way he thinks best, without troubling himself about the authority of the church, without paying any heed to its wishes, its counsels, its orders, nay, even in spite of its reprimands. To trace out and prescribe for the citizen any line of conduct, on any pretext whatsoever, is to be guilty of an abuse of ecclesiastical authority, against which one is bound to act with all one's might. The principles from which these doctrines spring have been solemnly condemned by our predecessor Pius VI in his constitution Auctorum Fidei. The Magisterium of the Church But it is not enough for the modernist school that the state should be separated from the church, for as faith is to be subordinated to science, as far as phenomenal elements are concerned, so too in temporal matters the church must be subject to the state. They do not say this openly, as yet, but they are logically committed to it. For, given the principle that in temporal matters the state possesses absolute mastery, it will follow that when the believer, not fully satisfied with his merely internal acts of religion, proceeds to external acts, such, for instance, as the administration or reception of the sacraments, these will fall under the control of the state. What will then become of ecclesiastical authority, which can only be exercised by external acts? Obviously, it will be completely under the dominion of the state. It is this inevitable consequence which impels many among liberal Protestants to reject all external worship, nay, all external religious community, and makes them advocate what they call individual religion. If the modernists have not yet reached this point, they do ask the church, in the meanwhile, to be good enough to follow spontaneously where they lead her, and adapt herself to the civil forms in vogue. Such are their ideas about disciplinary authority. But far more advanced, and far more pernicious, are their teachings on doctrinal and dogmatic authority. This is their conception of the magisterium of the church. No religious society, they say, can be a real unit unless the religious conscience of its members be one, and one also the formula which they adopt. For this double unity requires a kind of common mind, whose office is to find and determine the formula that corresponds best with the common conscience, and it must have, moreover, an authority sufficient to enable it to impose upon the community the formula which has been decided upon. From the combination, and as it were, fusion of the common mind which draws up the formula, and the authority which imposes it, arises, according to the modernists, the notion of the ecclesiastical magisterium. And as this magisterium springs, in its last analysis, from the individual consciences, and possesses this mandate for their benefit, it follows that the ecclesiastical magisterium must be subordinate to them, and should, therefore, take democratic forms. To prevent individual consciences from revealing freely and openly the impulses they feel, to hinder criticism from imperiling dogmas towards their necessary evolutions, this is not a legitimate use, but an abuse of a power given for the public utility. So, too, a due method and measure must be observed in the exercise of authority. To condemn and proscribe a work, without the knowledge of the author, 
without hearing his explanations, without discussion, assuredly savours of tyranny. And thus, here again, a mean must be found to save the full rights of authority, on the one hand, and of liberty, on the other. In the meanwhile, the proper course for the Catholic will be to proclaim publicly his profound respect for authority, and continue to follow his own bent. Their general directions for the Church may be put in this way. Since the end of the Church is entirely spiritual, the religious authority should strip itself of all that external pomp which adorns it in the eyes of the public. And here they forget that while religion is essentially for the mind, it is not exclusively for the mind, and that the honour paid to authority is reflected back on Jesus Christ, who instituted it. THE EVOLUTION OF DOCTRINE To finish with this whole question of faith and its shoots, it remains to be seen, venerable brethren, what the modernists have to say about their development. First of all, they lay down the general principle that, in a living religion, everything is subject to change, and must in fact change. And in this way they pass to what may be said to be, among the chief of their doctrines, that of evolution. To the worship of evolution everything is subject. Dogma, church, worship, the books we revere as sacred, even faith itself, and the penalty of disobedience is death. The enunciation of this principle will not astonish anybody who bears in mind what the modernists have had to say about each of these subjects. Having laid down this law of evolution, the modernists themselves teach us how it works out. And first, with regard to faith. The primitive form of faith, they tell us, was rudimentary and common to all men alike, for it had its origin in human nature and human life. Vital evolution brought with it progress, not by the accretion of new and purely adventitious forms from without, but by an increasing penetration of the religious sentiment in the consciousness. This progress was of two kinds, negative, by the elimination of all foreign elements, such, for example, as the sentiment of family or nationality, and positive by that intellectual and moral refining of man, by means of which the idea of the divine was enlarged and enlightened, while the religious sentiment became more elevated and more intense. For the progress of faith no other causes are to be assigned than those which are adduced to explain its origin, but to them must be added those religious geniuses whom we call prophets, and of whom Christ was the greatest, both because in their lives and their words there was something mysterious which faith attributed to the divinity, and because it fell to their lot to have new and original experiences fully in harmony with the needs of their time. The progress of dogma is due chiefly to the obstacles which faith has to surmount, to the enemies it has to vanquish, to the contradictions it has to repel. Add to this a perpetual striving to penetrate ever more profoundly its own mysteries. Thus, to omit other examples, as it happened in the case of Christ, in him that divine something which faith admitted in him expanded in such a way that he was at last held to be God. The chief stimulus of evolution in the domain of worship consists in the need of adapting itself to the uses and customs of peoples, as well as the need of availing itself of the value which certain acts have acquired by long usage. Finally, evolution in the church itself is fed by the need of accommodating itself to historical conditions and of harmonising itself with existing forms of society. Such is religious evolution in detail. And here, before proceeding further, we would have you note well this whole theory of necessities and needs, for it is at the root of the entire system of the modernists, and it is upon it that they will erect that famous method of theirs called the historical. Still continuing the consideration of the evolution of doctrine, it is to be noted that evolution is due, no doubt, to those stimulants styled needs, 
but if left to their action alone it would run a great risk of bursting the bounds of tradition and thus turned aside from its primitive vital principle would lead to ruin instead of progress hence studying more closely the ideas of the modernists evolution is described as resulting from the conflict of two forces one of them tending towards progress the other towards conservatism the conserving force in the church is tradition and tradition is represented by religious authority and this both by right and in fact for by right it is in the very nature of authority to protect tradition and in fact for authority raised as it is above the contingencies of life feels hardly or not at all the spurs of progress the progressive force on the contrary which responds to the inner needs lies in the individual consciences and ferments there especially in such of them as are in most intimate contact with life note here venerable brethren the appearance already of that most pernicious doctrine which would make of the laity a factor of progress in the church now it is by a species of compromise between the forces of conservatism and of progress that is to say between authority and individual consciences that changes and advances take place the individual consciences of some of them act on the collective conscience which brings pressure to bear on the depositories of authority until the latter consent to a compromise and the pact being made authority sees to its maintenance with all this in mind one understands how it is that the modernists express astonishment when they are reprimanded or punished what is imputed to them as a fault they regard as a sacred duty the needs of consciences no one knows better than they since they are in closer touch with them than even the ecclesiastical authority having a voice and a pen they use both publicly for this is their duty let authority rebuke them as much as it pleases they have their own conscience on their side and an intimate experience which tells them with certainty that what they deserve is not blame but praise then they reflect that after all there is no progress without a battle and no battle without its victim and victims they are willing to be like the prophets and christ himself they have no bitterness in their hearts against the authority which uses them roughly for after all it is only doing its duty as authority their sole grief is that it remains deaf to their warnings because delay multiplies the obstacles which impede the progress of souls but the hour will most surely come when there will be no further chance for tergiversation for if the laws of evolution may be checked for a while they cannot be ultimately destroyed and so they go their way reprimands and condemnations notwithstanding masking an incredible audacity under a mock semblance of humility while they make a show of bowing their heads their hands and minds are more intent than ever on carrying out their purposes and this policy they follow willingly and wittingly both because it is a part of their system that authority is to be stimulated but not dethroned and because it is necessary for them to remain within the ranks of the church in order that they may gradually transform the collective conscience thus unconsciously avowing that the common conscience is not with them and that they have no right to claim to be its interpreters thus then venerable brethren for the modernists both as authors and propagandists there is to be nothing stable nothing immutable in the church nor indeed are they without precursors in their doctrines for it was of these that our predecessor pius the ninth wrote these enemies of divine revelation extolled human progress to the skies and with rash and sacrilegious daring would have it introduced into the catholic religion as if this religion were not the work of god but of man or some kind of philosophical discovery susceptible of perfection by human efforts on the subject of revelation and dogma in particular the doctrine of the modernists offers nothing new we find it condemned in the syllabus of pius the ninth 
where it is enunciated in these terms. Divine revelation is imperfect, and therefore subject to continual and indefinite progress, corresponding with the progress of human reason, and condemned still more solemnly in the Vatican Council. The doctrine of the faith which God has revealed has not been proposed to human intelligences to be perfected by them as if it were a philosophical system, but as a divine deposit entrusted to the spouse of Christ to be faithfully guarded and infallibly interpreted. Hence the sense, too, of the sacred dogmas is that which our Holy Mother, the Church, has once declared, nor is this sense ever to be abandoned on plea or pretext of a more profound comprehension of the truth. Nor is the development of our knowledge, even concerning the faith, impeded by this pronouncement. On the contrary, it is aided and promoted. For the same counsel continues, let intelligence and science and wisdom, therefore, increase and progress abundantly and vigorously in individuals, and in the mass, in the believer, and in the whole church throughout the ages and the centuries, but only in its own kind, that is, according to the same dogma, the same sense, the same acceptation. The Modernist as Historian and Critic After having studied the Modernist as philosopher, believer, and theologian, it now remains for us to consider him as historian, critic, apologist, reformer. Some modernists, devoted to historical studies, seem to be greatly afraid of being taken for philosophers. About philosophy, they tell you, they know nothing whatever, and in this they display remarkable astuteness, for they are particularly anxious not to be suspected of being prejudiced in favour of philosophical theories, which would lay them open to the charge of not being objective, to use the word in vogue. And yet the truth is that their history and their criticism are saturated with their philosophy, and that their historico-critical conclusions are the natural fruit of their philosophical principles. This will be patent to anybody who reflects. Their first three laws are contained in those three principles of their philosophy already dealt with the principle of agnosticism, the principle of the transfiguration of things by faith, and the principle which we have called of disfiguration. Let us see what consequences flow from each of them. Agnosticism tells us that history, like every other science, deals entirely with phenomena, and the consequence is that God, and every intervention of God in human affairs, is to be relegated to the domain of faith as belonging to it alone. In things where a double element, the divine and the human, mingles, in Christ, for example, or in the church, or the sacraments, or the many other objects of the same kind, a division must be made, and the human element assigned to history, while the divine will go to faith. Hence we have that distinction, so current among the modernists, between the Christ of history and the Christ of faith between the Church of History and the Church of Faith, between the Sacraments of History and the Sacraments of Faith, and so on. Next we find that the human element itself, which the historian has to work on, as it appears in the documents, has been by faith transfigured, that is to say, raised above its historical conditions. It becomes necessary, therefore, to eliminate also the accretions which faith has added, to assign them to faith itself and to the history of faith. Thus, when treating of Christ, the historian must set aside all that surpasses man in his natural condition, either according to the psychological conception of him, or according to the place and period of his existence. Finally, by virtue of the third principle, even those things which are not outside the sphere of history, they pass through the crucible, excluding from history and relegation to faith everything which, in their judgment, is not in harmony with what they call the logic of facts, and in character with the persons of whom they are predicated. Thus they will not allow that Christ ever uttered those things which do not seem to be within the capacity of the multitudes that listened to him. 
Hence they delete from his real history and transfer to faith all the allegories found in his discourses. Do you inquire as to the criterion they adopt to enable them to make these divisions? The reply is that they argue from the character of the man, from his condition of life, from his education, from the circumstances under which the facts took place. In short, from criteria which, if one considers them well, are purely subjective. Their method is to put themselves into the position and person of Christ, and then to attribute to him what they would have done under like circumstances. In this way, absolutely a priori, and acting on philosophical principles, which they admit they hold, but which they affect to ignore, they proclaim that Christ, according to what they call his real history, was not God, and never did anything divine, and that as man he did and said only what they, judging from the time in which he lived, can admit him to have said or done. Criticism and its Principles And as history receives its conclusions, ready-made, from philosophy, so too criticism takes its own from history. The critic, on the data furnished him by the historian, makes two parts of all his documents. Those that remain after the triple elimination above described go to form the real history. The rest is attributed to the history of the faith, or, as it is styled, to internal history. For the modernists distinguish very carefully between these two kinds of history, and it is to be noted that they oppose the history of the faith to real history precisely as real. Thus we have a double Christ, a real Christ, and a Christ, the one of faith, who never really existed, a Christ who has lived at a given time and in a given place, and a Christ who has never lived outside the pious meditations of the believer, the Christ, for instance, whom we find in the Gospel of St. John, which is pure speculation from beginning to end. But the dominion of philosophy over history does not end here. Given that division, of which we have spoken, of the documents into two parts, the philosopher steps in again with his principle of vital imminence, and shows how everything in the history of the Church is to be explained by vital emanation. And since the cause, or condition, of every vital emanation whatsoever is to be found in some need, it follows that no fact can antedate the need which produced it. Historically, the fact must be posterior to the need. See how the historian works on this principle. He goes over his documents again, whether they be found in the sacred books or elsewhere, draws up from them his list of the successive needs of the church, whether relating to dogma or liturgy or other matters, and then he hands his list over to the critic. The critic takes in hand the documents dealing with the history of faith and distributes them, period by period, so that they correspond exactly with the list of needs, always guided by the principle that the narration must follow the facts, as the facts follow the needs. It may, at times, happen that some parts of the sacred scriptures, such as the epistles, themselves constitute the fact created by the need. Even so, the rule holds that the age of any document can only be determined by the age in which each need has manifested itself in the church. Further, a distinction must be made between the beginning of a fact and its development, for what is born on one day requires time for growth. Hence the critic must once more go over his documents, ranged as they are through the different ages, and divide them again into two parts, separating those that regard the first stage of the facts from those that deal with their development, and these he must again arrange according to their periods. Then the philosopher must come in again to impose on the historian the obligation of following, in all his studies, the precepts and laws of evolution. It is next for the historian to scrutinise his documents once more, to examine carefully the circumstances and conditions affecting the church during the different periods, the conserving force she has put forth, 
the needs, both internal and external, that have stimulated her to progress, the obstacles she has had to encounter. In a word, everything that helps to determine the manner in which the laws of evolution have been fulfilled in her. This done, he finishes his work by drawing up, in his broad lines, a history of the development of the facts. The critic follows, and fits in the rest of the document with this sketch. He takes up his pen, and soon the history is made complete. Now, we ask here, who is the author of this history? The historian? The critic? Assuredly, neither of these, but the philosopher. From beginning to end, everything in it is a priori, and a priori in a way that reeks of heresy. These men are certainly to be pitied, and of them the apostle might well say, they became vain in their thoughts. Professing themselves wise, they became fools. Letter to the Romans, chapter 1, verses 21 and 22. But, at the same time, they excite just indignation when they accuse the church of torturing the texts, arranging and confusing them after its own fashion and for the needs of its cause. In this they are accusing the church of something for which their own conscience plainly reproaches them. How the Bible is dealt with The result of this dismembering of the sacred books and this partition of them throughout the centuries is naturally that the scriptures can no longer be attributed to the authors whose names they bear. The modernists have no hesitation in affirming commonly that these books, and especially the Pentateuch and the first three Gospels, have been gradually formed by additions to a primitive brief narration, by interpolations of theological or allegorical interpretation, by transitions, by joining different passages together. This means, briefly, that in the sacred books we must admit a vital evolution, springing from and corresponding with the evolution of faith. The traces of this evolution, they tell us, are so visible in the books that one might almost write a history of them. Indeed, this history they do actually write, and with such an easy security that one might believe them to have, with their own eyes, seen the writers at work through the ages amplifying the sacred books. To aid them in this, they call to their assistance that branch of criticism which they call textual, and labour to show that such a fact, or such a phrase, is not in its right place, and adducing other arguments of the same kind. They seem, in fact, to have constructed for themselves certain type or narration and discourses, upon which they base their decision as to whether a thing is out of place or not. Judge, if you can, how men with such a system are fitted for practising this kind of criticism, to hear them talk about their works on the sacred books, in which they have been able to discover so much that is defective, one would imagine that before them no one ever even glanced through the pages of Scripture, whereas the truth is that a whole multitude of doctors, infinitely superior to them in genius, in erudition, in sanctity, have sifted the sacred books in every way, and so far from finding imperfections in them, have thanked God more and more the deeper they have gone into them, for his divine bounty in having vouchsafed to speak thus to men. Unfortunately, these great doctors did not enjoy the same age to study that are possessed by the modernists for their guide and rule, a philosophy borrowed from the negation of God and a criterion which consists of themselves. We believe, then, that we have set forth, with sufficient clearness, the historical methods of the modernists. The philosopher leads the way, the historian follows, and then, in due order, come internal and textual criticism. And since it is characteristic of the first cause to communicate its virtue to secondary causes, it is quite clear that the criticism we are concerned with is an agnostic, immanentist, and evolutionist criticism. Hence, anybody who embraces it and employs it makes profession thereby of the errors contained in it, 
and places himself in opposition to Catholic faith. This being so, one cannot but be greatly surprised by the consideration which is attached to it by certain Catholics. Two causes may be assigned for this. First, the close alliance, independent of all differences of nationality or religion, which the historians and critics of this school have formed among themselves. Second, the boundless effrontery of these men. Let one of them but open his mouth, and the others applaud him in chorus, proclaiming that science has made another step forward. Let an outsider but hint at a desire to inspect the new discovery with his own eyes, and they are on him in a body. Deny it, and you are an ignoramus. Embrace it and defend it, and there is no praise too warm for you. In this way they win over many who, did they but realise what they are doing, would shrink back with horror. The impudence and the domineering of some, and the thoughtlessness and imprudence of others, have combined to generate a pestilence in the air which penetrates everywhere and spreads the contagion. But let us pass to the apologist. The modernist as apologist. The modernist apologist depends in two ways on the philosopher. First, indirectly, inasmuch as his theme is history. History dictated, as we have seen, by the philosopher. And second, directly, inasmuch as he takes both his laws and his principles from the philosopher. Hence that common precept of the modernist school that the new apologetics must be fed from psychological and historical sources. The modernist apologists, then, enter the arena by proclaiming to the rationalists that, though they are defending religion, they have no intention of employing the data of the sacred books or the histories in current use in the church and composed according to old methods, but real history, written on modern principles and according to rigorously modern methods. In all this, they are not using an argumentum ad hominem, but are stating the simple fact that they hold that the truth is to be found only in this kind of history. They feel that it is not necessary for them to dwell on their own sincerity in their writings. They are already known to and praised by the rationalists as fighting under the same banner, and they not only plume themselves on these encomiums, which are a kind of salary to them, but would only provoke nausea in a real Catholic, but use them as an offset to the reprimands of the Church. But let us see how the modernist conducts his apologetics. The aim he sets before him is to make the non-believer attain that experience of the Catholic religion which, according to the system, is the basis of faith. There are two ways open to him, the objective and the subjective. The first of them proceeds from agnosticism. It tends to show that religion, and especially the Catholic religion, is endowed with such vitality as to compel every psychologist and historian of good faith to recognise that its history hides some unknown element. To this end it is necessary to prove that this religion, as it exists today, is that which was founded by Jesus Christ. That is to say, that it is the product of the progressive development of the germ which he brought into the world. Hence it is imperative, first of all, to establish what this germ was, and this the modernist claims to be able to do by the following formula. Christ announced the coming of the kingdom of God, which was to be realised within a brief lapse of time, and of which he was to become the Messiah, the divinely given agent and ordainer. Then it must be shown how this germ, always imminent and permanent in the bosom of the church, has gone on slowly developing in the course of history adapting itself successively to the different mediums through which it has passed, borrowing from them, by vital assimilation, all the dogmatic, cultural, ecclesiastical forms that served its purpose. Whilst, on the other hand, it surmounted all obstacles, vanquished all enemies, and survived all assaults and all combats. Anybody who well and duly considers this mass of obstacles, adversaries, attacks, combats, and the vitality and fecundity which the Church has shown throughout them all, must admit 
that if the laws of evolution are visible in her life, they fail to explain the whole of her history. The unknown rises forth from it and presents itself before us. Thus do they argue, never suspecting that their determination of the primitive germ is an a priori of agnostic and evolutionist philosophy, and that the formula of it has been gratuitously invented for the sake of buttressing their position. But while they endeavour, by this line of reasoning, to secure access for the Catholic religion into souls, these new apologists are quite ready to admit that there are many distasteful things in it. Nay, they admit openly, and with ill-concealed satisfaction, that they have found that even its dogma is not exempt from errors and contradictions. They add also that this is not only excusable, but, curiously enough, even right and proper. In the sacred books there are many passages referring to science or history where manifest errors are to be found. But the subject of these books is not science or history, but religion and morals. In them history and science serve only as a species of covering to enable the religious and moral experiences wrapped up in them to penetrate more readily among the masses. The masses understood science and history as they are expressed in these books, and it is clear that had science and history been expressed in a more perfect form, this would have proved rather a hindrance than a help. Then, again, the sacred books, being essentially religious, are consequently necessarily living. Now life has its own truth and its own logic, quite different from rational truth and rational logic, belonging, as they do, to a different order. That is, truth of adaptation and of proportion, both with the medium in which it exists and with the end towards which it tends. Finally, the modernists, losing all sense of control, go so far as to proclaim as true and legitimate everything that is explained by life. We, venerable brethren, for whom there is but one and only truth, and who hold that the sacred books, written under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, have God for their author, Dogmatic Constitution on the Catholic Faith, of Revelation, Canon 2, declare that this is equivalent to attributing to God himself the lie of utility or officious lie. And we say, with St. Augustine, in an authority so high, admit but one officious lie, and there will not remain a single passage of those apparently difficult to practice or to believe, which, on the same most pernicious rule, may not be explained as a lie uttered by the author willfully and to serve a purpose. Epistle 28 And thus it will come about, the holy doctor continues, that everybody will believe, and refuse to believe, what he likes or dislikes. But the modernists pursue their way gaily. They grant also that certain arguments adduced in the sacred books, like those, for example, which are based on the prophecies, have no rational foundation to rest on. But they will defend even these as artifices of preaching, which are justified by life. Do they stop here? No, indeed, for they are ready to admit, nay, to proclaim, that Christ himself manifestly erred in determining the time when the coming of the kingdom of God was to take place. And they tell us that we must not be surprised at this, since even Christ was subject to the laws of life. After this, what is to become of the dogmas of the church? The dogmas brim over with flagrant contradictions. But what matter that, since, apart from the fact that vital logic accepts them, they are not repugnant to symbolical truth? Are we not dealing with the infinite, and has not the infinite an infinite variety of aspects? In short, to maintain and defend these theories, they do not hesitate to declare that the noblest homage that can be paid to the infinite is to make it the object of contradictory propositions. But when they justify even contradictions, what is it that they will refuse to justify? Subjective Arguments But it is not solely by objective arguments that the non-believer may be disposed to faith. There are also subjective ones at the disposal of the modernists, and for those they return to their doctrine of imminence, 
They endeavour, in fact, to persuade their non-believer that down in the very deeps of his nature and his life lie the need and the desire for religion, and this, not a religion of any kind, but the specific religion known as Catholicism, which, they say, is absolutely postulated by the perfect development of life. And here we cannot but deplore once more, and grievously, that there are Catholics who, while rejecting imminence as a doctrine, employ it as a method of apologetics, and who do this so imprudently that they seem to admit that there is, in human nature, a true and rigorous necessity with regard to the supernatural order, and not merely a capacity and a suitability for the supernatural, such as has at all times been emphasised by Catholic apologists. Truth to tell, it is only the moderate modernists who make this appeal to an exigency for the Catholic religion. As for the others, who might be called integralists, they would show to the non-believer, hidden away in the very depths of his being, the very germ which Christ himself bore in his conscience and which he bequeathed to the world. Such, venerable brethren, is a summary description of the apologetic method of the modernists, in perfect harmony, as you may see, with their doctrines. Methods and doctrines brimming over with errors, made not for edification, but for destruction, not for the formation of Catholics, but for the plunging of Catholics into heresy, methods and doctrines that would be fatal to any religion. The Modernist as Reformer It remains for us now to say a few words about the Modernist as Reformer. From all that has preceded, some idea may be gained of the reforming mania which possesses them. In all Catholicism there is absolutely nothing upon which it does not fasten. Reform of philosophy, especially in the seminaries. The scholastic philosophy is to be relegated to the history of philosophy among obsolete systems, and the young men are to be taught modern philosophy, which alone is true and suited to the times in which we live. Reform of theology. Rational theology is to have modern philosophy for its foundation, and positive theology is to be founded on the history of dogma. As for history, it must be, for the future, written and taught only according to their modern methods and principles. Dogmas and their evolution are to be harmonised with science and history. In the Catechism, no dogmas are to be inserted except those that have been duly reformed and are within the capacity of the people. Regarding worship, the number of external devotions is to be reduced, or at least steps must be taken to prevent their further increase, though indeed some of the admirers of symbolism are disposed to be more indulgent on this head. Ecclesiastical government requires to be reformed in all its branches, but especially in its disciplinary and dogmatic parts. Its spirit and its external manifestations must be put in harmony with the public conscience, which is now wholly for democracy. A share in ecclesiastical government should, therefore, be given to the lower ranks of the clergy, and even to the laity, and authority should be decentralised. The Roman congregations, and especially the index and the holy office, are to be reformed. The ecclesiastical authority must change its line of conduct in the social and political world. While keeping outside political and social organisation, it must adapt itself to those which exist in order to penetrate them with its spirit. With regard to morals, they adopt the principle of the Americanists, that the active virtues are more important than the passive, both in the estimation in which they must be held and in the exercise of them. The clergy are asked to return to their ancient lowliness and poverty, and in their ideas and action are to be guided by the principles of modernism. And there are some who, echoing the teaching of their Protestant masters, would like the suppression of ecclesiastical celibacy. What is there left in the church which is not to be reformed according to their principles? Modernism and all the heresies. It may be, venerable brethren, that some may think we have dwelt too long on this exposition of the doctrines of the modernists. But it was necessary, 
both in order to refute their customary charge that we do not understand their ideas and to show that their system does not consist in scattered and unconnected theories but in a perfectly organized body all the parts of which are solidly joined so that it is not possible to admit one without admitting all for this reason too we have had to give this exposition a somewhat didactic form and not to shrink from employing certain uncouth terms in use among the modernists and now can anybody who takes a survey of the whole system be surprised that we should define it as the synthesis of all heresies were one to attempt the task of collecting together all the errors that have been broached against the faith and to concentrate the sap and substance of them all into one he could not better succeed than the modernists have done nay they have done more than this for as we have already intimated their system means the destruction not of the catholic religion alone but of all religion with good reason do the rationalists applaud them for well, the most sincere and the frankest among the rationalists warmly welcome the modernists as their most valuable allies for let us return for a moment venerable brethren to that most disastrous doctrine of agnosticism by it every avenue that leads the intellect to god is barred but the modernist would seek to open others available for sentiment and action vain efforts for after all what is sentiment but the reaction of the soul on the action of the intelligence or the senses take away the intelligence and man already inclined to follow the senses becomes their slave vain too from another point of view for all these fantasies on the religious sentiment will never be able to destroy common sense and common sense tells us that emotion and everything that leads the heart captive proves a hindrance instead of a help to the discovery of truth we speak of course of truth in itself as for that other purely subjective truth the fruit of sentiment and action if it serves its purpose for the jugglery of words it is of no use to the man who wants to know above all things whether outside himself there is a god into whose hands he is one day to fall true the modernists do call in experience to eke out their system but what does this experience add to sentiment absolutely nothing beyond a certain intensity and a proportionate deepening of the conviction of the reality of the object but these two will never make sentiment into anything but sentiment nor deprive it of its characteristic which is to cause deception when the intelligence is not there to guide it on the contrary they but confirm and aggravate this characteristic for the more intense sentiment is the more it is sentimental in matters of religious sentiment and religious experience you know venerable brethren how necessary is prudence and how necessary too the science which directs prudence you know it from your own dealings with souls and especially with souls in whom sentiment predominates you know it also from your reading of ascetical books books for which the modernists have but little esteem but which testify to a science and a solidity very different from theirs and to a refinement and subtlety of observation of which the modernists give no evidence is it not really folly or at least sovereign imprudence to trust oneself without control to modernist experiences let us for a moment put the question if experiences have so much value in their eyes why do they not attach equal weight to the experience that thousands upon thousands of catholics have that the modernists are on the wrong road is it perchance that all experiences except those felt by the modernists are false and deceptive the vast majority of mankind holds and always will hold firmly that sentiment and experience alone when not enlightened and guided by reason do not lead to the knowledge of god what remains then but the annihilation of all religion atheism certainly it is not the doctrine of symbolism will save us from this for if all the intellectual elements as they call them of religion are pure symbols 
Will not the very name of God, or a divine personality, be also a symbol? And if this be admitted, will not the personality of God become a matter of doubt, and the way opened to pantheism? And to pantheism, that other doctrine of divine immanence leads directly. For does it, we ask, leave God distinct from man, or not? If yes, in what way does it differ from Catholic doctrine, and why reject external revelation? If no, we are at once in pantheism. Now, the doctrine of immanence, in the modernist exception, holds and professes that every phenomenon of conscience proceeds from man as man. The rigorous conclusion from this is the identity of man with God, which means pantheism. The same conclusion follows from the distinction modernists make between science and faith. The object of science, they say, is the reality of the knowable. The object of faith, on the contrary, is the reality of the unknowable. Now, what makes the unknowable unknowable is its disproportion with the intelligible, a disproportion which nothing whatever, even in the doctrine of the modernist, can suppress. Hence the unknowable remains, and will eternally remain unknowable, to the believer as well as to the man of science. Therefore, if any religion at all is possible, it can only be the religion of an unknowable reality. And why this religion might not be that universal soul of the universe, of which a rationalist speaks, is something we do not see. Certainly this suffices to show superabundantly by how many roads modernism leads to the annihilation of all religion. The first step in this direction was taken by Protestantism. The second is made by modernism. The next will plunge headlong into atheism. End of part two of encyclical letter Pescendi Dominici Gregis on the errors of the modernists. Section three of Pescendi Dominici Gregis on the errors of the modernists by Pope St. Pius X. Translated by Thomas E. Judge. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Encyclical. Continued. Part 2. The Cause of Modernism. To penetrate still deeper into modernism, and to find a suitable remedy for such a deep sore, it behooves us, venerable brethren, to investigate the causes which have engendered it and which foster its growth. That the proximate and immediate cause consists in a perversion of the mind cannot be open to doubt. The remote causes seem to us to be reduced to two, curiosity and pride. Curiosity by itself, if not prudently regulated, suffices to explain all errors. Such is the opinion of our predecessor, Gregory the Sixteenth, who wrote, A lamentable spectacle is that presented by the aberrations of human reason when it yields to the spirit of novelty, when, against the warning of the Apostle, it seeks to know beyond what it is meant to know, when, relying too much on itself, it thinks it can find the truth outside the church, wherein truth is found without the slightest shadow of error. Encyclical Singulari Nos, July 1834 But it is pride which exercises an incomparably greater sway over the soul to bind it and plunge into error and pride sits in modernism as in its own house, finding sustenance everywhere in its doctrines, and an occasion to flaunt itself in all its aspects. It is pride which fills modernists with that confidence in themselves, and leads them to hold themselves up as the rule for all, pride which puffs them up with that vain glory which allows them to regard themselves as the sole possessors of knowledge, and makes them say, inflated with presumption, we are not as the rest of men, and which, to make them really not as other men, leads them to embrace all kinds of the most absurd novelties. It is pride which rouses in them the spirit of disobedience, and causes them to demand a compromise between authority and liberty. 
It is pride that makes of them the reformers of others, while they forget to reform themselves, and which begets the absolute want of respect for authority, not accepting the supreme authority. No, truly, there is no road which leads so directly and so quickly to modernism as pride. When a Catholic layman or a priest forgets that precept of the Christian life, which obliges us to renounce ourselves if we would follow Jesus Christ, and neglects to tear pride from his heart, ah, but he is a fully ripe subject for the errors of modernism. Hence, venerable brethren, it will be your first duty to thwart such proud men, to employ them only in the lowest and obscurest offices. The higher they try to rise, the lower let them be placed, so that their lowly position may deprive them of the power of causing damage. Sound your young clerics, too, most carefully, by yourselves and by the directors of your seminaries, and when you find the spirit of pride among any of them, reject them without compunction from the priesthood. Would to God that this had always been done with the proper vigilance and constancy. If we pass from the moral to the intellectual causes of modernism, the first which presents itself, and the chief one, is ignorance. Yes, these very modernists, who pose as doctors of the church, who puff out their cheeks when they speak of modern philosophy, and show such contempt for scholasticism, have embraced the one with all its false glamour, because their ignorance of the other has left them without the means of being able to recognise confusion of thought and to refute sophistry. Their whole system, with all its errors, has been born of the alliance between faith and false philosophy. Methods of Propagandism If only they had displayed less zeal and energy in propagating it. But such is their activity and such their unwearying capacity for work on behalf of their cause, that one cannot but be pained to see them waste such labour in endeavouring to ruin the church, when they might have been of such service to her, had their efforts been better employed. Their artifices, to delude men's minds, are of two kinds. The first, to remove obstacles from their path. The second, to devise, and apply actively and patiently, every instrument that can serve their purpose. They recognise that the three chief difficulties for them are scholastic philosophy, the authority of the fathers and tradition, and the magisterium of the church, and on these they wage unrelenting war. For scholastic philosophy and theology they have only ridicule and contempt. Whether it is ignorance, or fear, or both, that inspires this conduct in them, certain it is that the passion for novelty is always united in them with hatred of scholasticism, and there is no surer sign that a man is on his way to modernism than when he begins to show his dislike for this system. Modernists and their admirers should remember the proposition condemned by Pius the Ninth: The method and principles which have served the doctors of scholasticism when treating of theology no longer correspond with the exigencies of our time or the progress of science. Syllabus of Errors, Proposition 13. They exercise all their ingenuity in diminishing the force and falsifying the character of tradition, so as to rob it of all its weight. But for Catholics, the Second Council of Nicaea will always have the force of law, where it condemns those who dare, after the impious fashion of heretics, to deride the ecclesiastical traditions to invent novelties of some kind, or endeavour, by malice or craft, to overthrow any one of the legitimate traditions of the Catholic Church. And Catholics will hold for law, also, the profession of the Fourth Council of Constantinople. We, therefore, profess to conserve and guard the rules bequeathed to the Holy Catholic and Apostolic Church by the Holy and Most Illustrious Apostles, by the Orthodox Councils, both general and local, and by every one of those divine interpreters, the fathers and doctors of the Church. Wherefore the Roman pontiffs, Pius the Fourth and Pius the Ninth, order the insertion in the profession of faith 
of the following declaration. I most firmly admit and embrace the apostolic and ecclesiastical traditions and other observances and constitutions of the Church. The modernists pass the same judgment on the most holy fathers of the Church as they pass on tradition, decreeing, with amazing effrontery, that, while personally most worthy of all veneration, they were entirely ignorant of history and criticism, for which they are only excusable on account of the time in which they lived. Finally, the modernists try, in every way, to diminish and weaken the authority of the ecclesiastical magisterium itself by sacrilegiously falsifying its origin, character, and rights, and by freely repeating the calumnies of all its adversaries. To all the band of modernists may be applied those words which our predecessor wrote with such pain, to bring contempt and odium on the mystic spouse of Christ, who is the true light, the children of darkness have been wont to cast in her face before the world a stupid calumny, and, perverting the meaning and force of things and words, to depict her as the friend of darkness and ignorance, and the enemy of light, science and progress. Motu proprio ut mysticum, 14th of March, 1891. This being so, venerable brethren, no wonder that the modernists vent all their gall and hatred on Catholics who sturdily fight the battles of the Church. But of all the insults they heap on them, those of ignorance and obstinacy are the favourites. When an adversary rises up against them with an erudition and force that render him redoubtable, they try to make a conspiracy of silence around him to nullify the effects of his attack while, in flagrant contrast with this policy towards Catholics, they load with constant praise the writers who range themselves on their side, hailing their works, exuding novelty in every page, with choruses of applause. For them, the scholarship of a writer is in direct proportion to the recklessness of his attacks on antiquity, and of his efforts to undermine tradition and the ecclesiastical magisterium. When one of their number falls under the condemnations of the church, the rest of them, to the horror of good Catholics, gather round him, heap public praise upon him, venerate him almost as a martyr to truth. The young, excited and confused by all this clamour of praise and abuse, some of them afraid of being branded as ignorant, others ambitious to be considered learned, and both classes goaded internally by curiosity and pride, often surrender and give themselves up to modernism. And here we have already some of the artifices employed by modernists to exploit their wares. What efforts they make to win new recruits! They seize upon chairs in the seminaries and universities and gradually make of them chairs of pestilence. From these sacred chairs they scatter, though not always openly, the seeds of their doctrines. They proclaim their teachings without disguise in congresses. They introduce them and make them the vogue in social institutions. Under their own names and under pseudonyms, they publish numbers of books, newspapers, reviews, and sometimes one and the same writer adopts a variety of pseudonyms to trap the incautious reader into believing in a whole multitude of modernist writers. In short, they leave nothing untried in action, discourses, writings, as though there were a frenzy of propaganda upon them. And the results of all this? We have to lament at the sight of many young men, once full of promise and capable of rendering great services to the church, now gone astray. And there is another sight that saddens us too, that of so many other Catholics who, while they certainly do not go so far as the former, have yet grown into the habit, as though they had been breathing a poisoned atmosphere, of thinking and speaking and writing with a liberty that ill becomes Catholics. They are to be found among the laity and in the ranks of the clergy, and they are not wanting even in the last place where one might expect to meet them, in religious institutes. If they treat of biblical questions, it is upon modernist principles. 
if they write history, it is to search out, with curiosity, and to publish openly, on the pretext of telling the whole truth, and with a species of ill-concealed satisfaction, everything that looks to them like a stain in the history of the church. Under the sway of certain a priori rules, they destroy, as far as they can, the pious traditions of the people, and bring ridicule on certain relics highly venerable from their antiquity. They are possessed by the empty desire of being talked about, and they know that they would never succeed in this were they to say only what has been always said. It may be that they have persuaded themselves that in all this they are really serving God and the Church. In reality, they only offend both, less perhaps by their works themselves than by the spirit in which they write and by the encouragement they are giving to the extravagances of the modernists. Part 3. Remedies Against this host of grave errors and its secret and open advance, our predecessor, Leo the Thirteenth of happy memory, worked strenuously, especially as regards the Bible, both in his words and his acts. But, as we have seen, the modernists are not easily deterred by such weapons. With an affectation of submission and respect, they proceeded to twist the words of the pontiff to their own sense, and his acts they described as directed against others than themselves. And the evil has gone on, increasing from day to day. We, therefore, venerable brethren, have determined to adopt at once the most efficacious measures in our power, and we beg and conjure you to see to it that in this most grave matter nobody will ever be able to say that you have been in the slightest degree wanting in vigilance, zeal, or firmness. And what we ask of you, and expect of you, we ask, and expect also, of all other pastors of souls, of all educators and professors of clerks, and, in a very special way, of the superiors of religious institutions. 1. The Study of Scholastic Philosophy In the first place, with regard to studies, we will and ordain that scholastic philosophy be made the basis of the sacred sciences. It goes without saying that if anything is met with among the scholastic doctors, which may be regarded as an excess of subtlety, or which is altogether destitute of probability, we have no desire whatever to propose it for the imitation of present generations. Leo the Thirteenth, encyclical Eterni Patris. And let it be clearly understood, above all things, that the scholastic philosophy we prescribe is that which the angelic doctor has bequeathed to us, and we, therefore, declare that all the ordinances of our predecessor on this subject continue fully in force, and as far as may be necessary. We do decree anew, and confirm, and ordain that they be, by all, strictly observed. In seminaries where they may have been neglected, let the bishops impose them and require their observance, and let this apply also to the superiors of religious institutions. Further, let professors remember that they cannot set St. Thomas aside, especially in metaphysical question, without grave detriment. On this philosophical foundation, the theological edifice is to be solidly raised. Promote the study of theology, venerable brethren, by all means in your power, so that your clerics, on leaving the seminaries, may admire and love it, and always find their delight in it. For in the vast and varied abundance of studies opening before the mind desirous of truth, everybody knows how the old maxim describes theology as so far in front of all others that every science and art should serve it and be to it as handmaidens. Leo the Thirteenth, Apostolic Letter, in Magna, December the tenth, eighteen eighty nine. We will add that we deem worthy of praise those who, with full respect for tradition, the Holy Fathers, and the ecclesiastical magisterium, undertake, with well balanced judgment, and guided by Catholic principles, which is not always the case 
seek to illustrate positive theology by throwing the light of true history upon it. Certainly, more attention must be paid to positive theology than in the past, but this must be done without detriment to scholastic theology, and those are to be disapproved of as modernist tendencies who seek to exalt positive theology in such a way as to seem to despise the scholastic. With regard to profane studies, suffice it to recall here what our predecessor has admirably said. Apply yourselves energetically to the study of natural sciences. The brilliant discoveries and the bold and useful applications of them made in our times, which have won such applause by our contemporaries, will be an object of perpetual praise for those that come after us. Leo Thirteenth, Allocution, March the 7th, 1880. But this do, without interfering with sacred studies, as our predecessor, in these most grave words, prescribed. If you carefully search for the cause of those errors, you will find that it lies in the fact that in these days, when the natural sciences absorb so much study, the more severe and lofty studies have been proportionately neglected. Some of them have almost passed into oblivion. Some of them are pursued in a half-hearted or superficial way, and, sad to say, now that they are fallen from their old estate, they have been disfigured by perverse doctrines and monstrous errors. We ordain, therefore, that the study of the natural science in the seminaries be carried on under this law. 2. Practical Application All these prescriptions, and those of our predecessor, are to be borne in mind whenever there is question of choosing directors and professors for seminaries and Catholic universities. Anybody who, in any way, is found to be imbued with modernism is to be excluded without compunction from these offices, and those who already occupy them are to be withdrawn. The same policy is to be adopted towards those who favour modernism, either by extolling the modernists or excusing their culpable conduct, by criticising scholasticism, the fathers, or by refusing obedience to ecclesiastical authority in any of its depositories, and towards those who show a love of novelty in history, archaeology, biblical exegesis, and, finally, towards those who neglect the sacred sciences or appear to prefer to them the profane. In all this question of studies, venerable brethren, you cannot be too watchful or too constant, but, most of all, in the choice of professors, for as a rule the students are modelled after the pattern of their masters. Strong in the consciousness of your duty, act always prudently, but vigorously. Equal diligence and severity are to be used in examining and selecting candidates for holy orders. Far, far from the clergy be the love of novelty. God hates the proud and the obstinate. For the future, the doctrine of theology and canon law must never be conferred on anybody who has not made the regular course of scholastic philosophy. If conferred, it shall be held as null and void. The rules laid down in 1896 by the Sacred Congregation of Bishops and Regulars for the Clerics, both secular and regular, of Italy, concerning the frequenting of the universities, we now decree to be extended to all nations. Clerics and priests inscribed in the Catholic Institute or university must not in the future follow in civil universities those courses for which there are chairs in the Catholic institutes to which they belong. If this has been permitted anywhere in the past, we ordain that it be not allowed for the future. Let the bishops who form the governing board of such Catholic institutes or universities watch with all care that these, our commands, be constantly observed. 3. Episcopal Vigilance Over Publications It is also the duty of the bishops to prevent writings infected with modernism, or favourable to it, from being read when they have been published, and to hinder their publication when they have not. No book or paper or periodical of this kind 
must ever be permitted to seminarists or university students. The injury to them would be equal to that caused by immoral reading. Nay, it would be greater, for such writings poison Christian life at its very fount. The same decision is to be taken concerning the writings of some Catholics, who, though not badly disposed themselves, but ill-instructed in theological studies, and imbued with modern philosophy, strive to make this harmonise with the faith, and, as they say, to turn it to the account of the faith. The name and reputation of these authors cause them to be read without suspicion, and they are, therefore, all the more dangerous in preparing the way of modernism. To give you some more general directions, venerable brethren, in a matter of such moment, we bid you do everything in your power to drive out of your diocese, even by solemn interdict, any pernicious books that may be in circulation there. The Holy See neglects no means to put down writings of this kind, but the number of them has now grown to such an extent that it is impossible to censure them all. Hence it happens that the medicine sometimes arrives too late, for the disease has taken root during the delay. We will, therefore, that the bishops, putting aside all fear and the prudence of the flesh, despising the outcries of the wicked, gently by all means, but constantly, do each his own share of this work, remembering the injunctions of Leo the Thirteenth in the Apostolic Constitution Officiorum. Let the ordinaries, acting in this also as delegates of the Apostolic See, exert themselves to prescribe and put out of reach of the faithful, injurious books or other writings printed or circulated in their dioceses. In this passage the bishops, it is true, receive a right, but they have also a duty imposed on them. Let no bishop think that he fulfils this duty by denouncing to us one or two books, while a great many others of the same kind are being published and circulated. Nor are you to be deterred by the fact that a book has obtained the imprimatur elsewhere, because both this may be merely stimulated, and because it may have been granted through carelessness or easiness or excessive confidence in the author, as may sometimes happen in religious orders. Besides, just as the same food does not agree equally with everybody, it may happen that a book, harmless in one place, may, on account of the different circumstances, be hurtful in another. Should a bishop, therefore, after having taken the advice of prudent persons, deem it right to condemn any of such books in his diocese, we not only give him ample faculty to do so, but we impose it upon him as a duty to do so. Of course it is our wish that in such action proper regard be used, and sometimes it will suffice to restrict the prohibition to the clergy, but even in such cases it will be obligatory on Catholic booksellers not to put on sale books condemned by the bishop. And while we are on this subject of booksellers, we wish the bishops to see to it that they do not, through desire for gain, put on sale unsound books. It is certain that in the catalogues of some of them, the books of the modernists are not unfrequently announced with no small praise. If they refuse obedience, let the bishops have no hesitation in depriving them of the title of Catholic booksellers. So, too, and with more reason, if they have the title of Episcopal booksellers, and if they have that of Pontifical, let them be denounced to the Apostolic See. Finally, we remind all of the 26th article of the above-mentioned Constitution Officiorum. All those who have obtained an apostolic faculty to read and keep forbidden books are not thereby authorised to read books and periodicals forbidden by the local ordinaries, unless the apostolic faculty expressly concedes permission to read and keep books condemned by anybody. 4. Censorship But it is not enough to hinder the reading and sale of bad books. It is also necessary to prevent them from being printed. Hence let the bishops use the utmost severity in granting permission to print. Under the rules of the Constitution Officiorum, 
many publications require the authorization of the ordinary, and in some dioceses it has been made the custom to have a suitable number of official censors for the examination of writings. We have the highest praise for this institution, and we not only exhort, but we order that it be extended to all dioceses. In all Episcopal curias, therefore, let censors be appointed for the revision of works intended for publication, and let the censors be chosen from both ranks of the clergy, secular and regular, men of age, knowledge and prudence, who will know how to follow the golden mean in their judgments. It shall be their office to examine everything which requires permission for publication, according to Articles 41 and 42 of the above-mentioned Constitution. The censor shall give his verdict in writing. If it be favourable, the bishop will give the permission for publication by the word imprimatur, which must always be preceded by the nihil obstat and the name of the censor. In the Curia of Rome, official censors shall be appointed just as elsewhere, and the appointment of them shall appertain to the master of the sacred palaces, after they have been proposed to the cardinal vicar and accepted by the sovereign pontiff. It will also be the office of the master of the sacred palaces to select the censor for each writing. Permission for publication will be granted by him, as well as by the cardinal vicar, or his vice-regent, and this permission, as above prescribed, must always be preceded by the nihil obstat and the name of the censor. Only on very rare and exceptional occasions, and on the prudent decision of the bishop, shall it be possible to omit mention of the censor. The name of the censor shall never be made known to the authors until he shall have given a favourable decision, so that he may not have to suffer annoyance either while he is engaged in examination of a writing, or in case he should deny his approval. Censors shall never be chosen from the religious orders unless the opinion of the principal, or in Rome, of the general, has been privately obtained and the provincial, or the general, must give a conscientious account of the character, knowledge, and orthodoxy of the candidate. We admonish religious superiors of their solemn duty never to allow anything to be published by any of their subjects without permission from themselves and from the ordinary. Finally, we affirm and declare that the title of censor has no value and can never be adduced to give credit to the private opinions of the person who holds it. Priests as Editors Having said this much in general, we now ordain, in particular, a more careful observance of Article 42 of the above-mentioned Constitution Officiorum. It is forbidden to secular priests, without the previous consent of the ordinary, to undertake the direction of papers or periodicals. This permission shall be withdrawn from any priest who makes a wrong use of it after having been admonished. With regard to priests, who are correspondents, or collaborators of periodicals, as it happens not infrequently that they write matter infected with modernism for their papers or periodicals, let the bishops see to it that this is not permitted to happen, and, should it happen, let them warn the writers, or prevent them from writing. The superiors of religious orders, too, we admonish with all authority to do the same, and should they fail in this duty, let the bishops make due provision with authority delegated by the Supreme Pontiff. Let there be, as far as this is possible, a special censor for newspapers and periodicals written by Catholics. It shall be his office to read, in due time, each number after it has been published, and if he find anything dangerous in it, let him order that it be corrected. The bishop shall have the same right even when the censor has seen nothing objectionable in a publication. 5. Congresses We have already mentioned congresses and public gatherings as among the means used by the modernists to propagate and defend their opinions. In the future, bishops shall not permit congresses of priests except on very rare occasions. When they do permit them, it shall only be on condition that matters appertaining to the bishops, or the apostolic see, be not treated in them, 
and that no motions or postulates be allowed that would imply a usurpation of sacred authority, and that no mention be made in them of modernism, Presbyterianism, or laicism. A congresses of this kind, which can only be held after permission in writing has been obtained in due time, and for each case, it shall not be lawful for priests of other dioceses to take part without the written permission of their ordinary. Further, no priest must lose sight of the solemn recommendation of Leo the Thirteenth. Let priests hold as sacred the authority of their bishops. Let them take it for certain that the sacerdotal ministry, if not exercised under the guidance of the bishops, can never be either holy, or very fruitful, or respectable. Encyclical Letter Nobilissima Galorum, 10th of February, 1884 6. Diocesan Watch Committees But of what avail, venerable brethren, will be all our commands and prescriptions if they be not dutifully and firmly carried out? And in order that this may be done, it has seemed expedient to us to extend to all dioceses the regulations laid down with great wisdom many years ago by the bishops of Umbria for theirs. In order, they say, to extirpate the errors already propagated and to prevent their further diffusion, and to remove those teachers of impiety through whom the pernicious effects of such diffusion are being perpetuated, this sacred assembly, following the example of St. Charles Borromeo, has decided to establish in each of the dioceses a council, consisting of approved members of both branches of the clergy, which shall be charged with the task of noting the existence of errors and the devices by which new ones are introduced and propagated, and to inform the bishop of the whole, so that he may take counsel with them as to the best means of nipping the evil in the bud and preventing its spreading for the ruination of souls, or, worse still, gaining strength and growth. Acts of the Congress of the Bishops of Umbria, November 1849, Title II, Article VI. We decree, therefore, that in every diocese, a council of this kind, which we are pleased to name the Council of Vigilance, be instituted without delay. The priests, called to form part in it, shall be chosen somewhat after the manner above prescribed for the censors, and they shall meet every two months on an appointed day under the presidency of the bishop. They shall be bound to secrecy as to their deliberations and decisions, and their function shall be as follows. They shall watch most carefully for every trace and sign of modernism, both in publications and in teaching, and to preserve from it the clergy and the young, they shall take all prudent, prompt, and efficacious measures. Let them combat novelties of words, remembering the admonitions of Leo the Thirteenth. Instruction S C N N E E E E, twenty seventh of January, nineteen o two. It is impossible to approve in Catholic publications of a style inspired by unsound novelty, which seems to deride the piety of the faithful, and dwells on the introduction of a new order of Christian life on new directions of the church, on new aspirations of the modern soul, on a new vocation of the clergy, on a new Christian civilization. Language of this kind is not to be tolerated, either in books or from chairs of learning. The councils must not neglect the books treating of the pious traditions of different places or of sacred relics. Let them not permit such questions to be discussed in periodicals destined to stimulate piety, neither with expressions savouring of mockery or contempt, nor by dogmatic pronouncements, especially when, as is often the case, what is stated as a certainty either does not pass the limits of probability, or is merely based on prejudiced opinion. Concerning sacred relics, let this be the rule. When bishops, who alone are judges in such matters, know for certain that a relic is not genuine, let them remove it at once from the veneration of the faithful. If the authentications of a relic happen to have been lost through civil disturbances, or in any other way, let it not be exposed for public veneration 
until the bishop has verified it. The argument of prescription, or well-founded presumption, is to have weight only when devotion to a relic is commendable by reason of its antiquity, according to the sense of the decree issued in 1896 by the Congregation of Indulgences and Sacred Relics. Ancient relics are to retain the veneration they have always enjoyed, except when in individual instances there are clear arguments that they are false or suppositious. In passing judgment on pious traditions, be it always borne in mind that, in this matter, the Church uses the greatest prudence, and that she does not allow traditions of this kind to be narrated in books, except with the utmost caution, and with the insertion of the declaration imposed by Urban the Eighth, And even then she does not guarantee the truth of the fact narrated. She simply does not forbid belief in things for which human arguments are not wanting. On this matter, the Sacred Congregation of Rites, thirty years ago, decreed as follows. These apparitions and revelations have neither been approved nor condemned by the Holy See, which has simply allowed that they be believed on purely human faith, on the tradition which they relate, corroborated by testimonies and documents worthy of credence. Decree, March the 2nd, 1877. Anybody who follows this rule has no cause for fear. For the devotion, based on any apparition, in so far as it regards the fact itself, that is to say, in as far as it is relative, always implies the hypothesis of the truth of the fact, while in as far as it is absolute, it must always be based on the truth, seeing that its object is the persons of the saints who are honoured. The same is true of relics. Finally, we entrust to the councils of vigilance the duty of overlooking, assiduously and diligently, social institutions, as well as writings on social questions, so that they may harbour no trace of modernism, but obey the prescriptions of the Roman pontiffs. 7. Triennial Returns Lest what we have laid down thus far should fall into oblivion, we will and ordain that the bishops of all dioceses, a year after the publication of these letters, and every three years thenceforward, furnish the Holy See with a diligent and sworn report on all the prescriptions contained in them, and on the doctrines that find currency among the clergy, and especially in the seminaries and other Catholic institutions. And we impose the like obligation on the generals of religious orders with regard to those under them. This, venerable brethren, is what we have thought it our duty to write to you for the salvation of all who believe. The adversaries of the Church will doubtless abuse what we have said to refurbish the old calumny by which we are traduced as the enemy of science and of the progress of humanity. In order to oppose a new answer to such accusations, which the history of the Christian religion refutes by never-failing arguments, it is our intention to establish and develop by every means in our power a special institute in which, through the cooperation of those Catholics who are most eminent for their learning, the progress of science and other realms of knowledge may be promoted under the guidance and teaching of Catholic truth. God grant that we may happily realise our design with the ready assistance of all those who bear a sincere love for the Church of Christ. But of this we will speak on another occasion. Meanwhile, venerable brethren, fully confident in your zeal and work, we beseech for you, with our whole heart and soul, the abundance of heavenly light, so that, in the midst of this great perturbation of men's minds from the insidious invasions of error on every side, you may see clearly what you ought to do, and may perform the task with all your strength and courage. May Jesus Christ, the author and finisher of our faith, be with you by his power, and may the Immaculate Virgin, the destroyer of all heresies, be with you by her prayers and aid. And we, as a pledge of our affection and of divine assistance in adversity, grant most affectionately and with all our heart to you, your clergy and people, the apostolic benediction. Given at St. Peter's, Rome, on the 8th day of September, 1907, 
the fifth year of our pontificate. Pius the tenth, Pope. End of encyclical letter, Pascendi Dominici Gregis, on the errors of the modernists. Section four of Pascendi Dominici Gregis, on the errors of the modernists, by Pope Saint Pius the tenth. Translated by Thomas E. Judge. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 1 of Appendix to Encyclical Letter Pascendi Dominici Gregis On the Errors of the Modernists Agnosticism Epistemology is the theory of the value of our knowledge. Its scope is to deal with the question, What do we really know? When discussing the objects of knowledge, there are two terms that should be accurately defined and carefully distinguished, noumena and phenomena. In ancient and medieval psychology, these words, when used at all, serve to mark the distinction between substances and accidents. The underlying and unchanging essence, or substance, was called noumenon, because knowledge of it belonged specially to the nous, or intellect. The changing accidents, such as colour, taste, and the rest, were called phenomena, or appearances, because they were those aspects of the object which were impressed on the senses. By modern writers, since the time of Kant, the distinction contrasts the object as it is in itself with the object as reflected in the mirror of our senses, or in the ideas formed of it by our intellect. The thing, as it is in itself, is called a noumenon. The reflections, images and symbols of it in our senses, or in our intellect, are called phenomena. Hence phenomena exist entirely in ourselves, but noumena exist in themselves and are entirely independent of our seeing them or thinking about them. Accidents, in the Aristotelian sense, as well as substance, would be noumena, according to this definition. Agnosticism restricts all our knowledge to phenomena in the subjective sense. Noumena, or things in themselves, it declares to be unknown and unknowable. From this standpoint, each of us is everlastingly imprisoned within the circle of his own subjective impressions. The world of objects, their nature and their relation to one another, are separated from our minds by an impassable gulf. Hence agnosticism, as applied to theology, denies that God, as he really is in nature and attributes, can be known by human reason. God, in the language of modern philosophy, is generally called the absolute or unconditioned. Since the modernists derive many of their principles from the epistemological system of Kant, the student of the encyclical will find some knowledge of Kant's peculiar form of agnosticism an invaluable aid in interpreting the condemned errors. The sage of Königsberg, as Kant has been called, distinguished between the pure, or speculative, reason and the practical reason. We may mention, in passing, that in the modernist's system, faith corresponds to the practical reason. Every idea is a unifying principle. All our inner experiences, our thoughts, emotions, desires, appetites, pains and pleasures are unified in the soul. This soul is the psychological idea. Objects that exist outside of us form one world. This unifying principle is called the cosmological idea. To reach a perfect unity, to unify our inner experience and the outer world of objects, the possible and the actual orders, we reduce or trace all things to God. This is the theological idea. If we maintain that our speculative reason can prove the existence of a reality corresponding to each of these three ideas, we are lodged, in spite of ourselves, according to Kant, in antinomies or contradictions. The existence of the soul, its freedom and immortality, the existence of a world of objects outside of us, and the existence of God are, of logical necessity, declared to be unknown and unknowable. Reason, being imminent, 
or indwelling, in each individual, cannot reach out to these objects, which are not contained in the phenomena or states of consciousness. It is well to note here that the modernist's theory of immanence is derived from Kant's view of the source of our knowledge of fundamental religious truths. But when we pass from knowledge to action, when we come to consider the moral law that should govern our conduct, and that issues from the depths of our own moral nature, we become absolutely certain of the freedom and immortality of the soul, and of the existence of God as necessary postulates of that law. Kant exalted action above knowledge. Therefore, pragmatism, which values knowledge only in so far as it enables us to act successfully and produce satisfactory results, is evidently an offshoot of Kant's teaching. Medieval theology and philosophy regarded knowledge for its own sake as supremely valuable, but in the new view, all knowledge is degraded to the low position of being the tool of successful action. The modernists are all pragmatists. They even go so far as to teach that dogmas of Catholic faith are of little or no value considered as standards of belief, and that their chief and primary significance is to be sought in their power to suggest attitudes or modes of moral conduct. Hence their system of philosophy is sometimes called the philosophy of action. The Catholic Church teaches on the subjects dealt with by agnosticism a. that God's existence and attributes can be known by the light of reason b. that he cannot be seen by us directly or to use the scriptural expression face to face as the ontologists teach with our natural powers until we attain the beatific vision we can only know him as he is mirrored in the works of his hands c. that no creature even though his mind be irradiated by the light of glory, can comprehend, that is, perfectly know, God. d. That no word can be used or predicated in the same sense of God and finite things, but only in an analogical or modified sense. But we are able, by a formal or mental abstraction, to understand the difference between the term, as applied to God, and as applied to creatures, so that our knowledge of God, as far as it goes, is accurate and free from error. Intellectualism The word intellectualism has one meaning in psychology, another in aesthetics, and a third in philosophy. 1. In psychology, it is the theory that undertakes to explain all our emotions and desires as secondary phases, by-products, or epiphenomena of our knowledge, which is regarded as a fundamental psychological process. 2. In aesthetics, it is the theory which lays stress on the intellectual content of the aesthetic object as the great factor of aesthetic value, and not on the sensual element which excites passion and emotion. 3. In philosophy, intellectualism means that all reality may become an object of knowledge, Intellectualism, therefore, in the philosophical sense, is opposed to agnosticism, because the former holds that noumena may be known, while agnosticism proclaims that they are unknown and unknowable. It is in the philosophical and psychological senses that the modernists repudiate it. There are certain truths, which Catholic theologians call motives of credibility, with which we shall deal more fully later on. They hold that these truths may be known by the natural light of reason. They are the foundations of our faith, and by means of them we render a rationabile obsequium, or we give a rational assent to the truths of revelation. Such motives of credibility are the existence of God, the fact of Christ's resurrection, the authenticity of the scriptures, etc., but the modernists strenuously deny the speculative reason is capable of demonstrating these truths. Immanence We have derived the modernists' theory of immanence from Kant's teaching of the impotency of the pure reason and the authority of the practical reason, or, to use a more popular term, of the conscience in the domain of religious belief. 
in order to understand what they mean by imminence, we must carefully distinguish three elements or factors of our religious faith. A. God. B. The religious sentiment. C. Our need of the divine. Imminence, or the indwelling of God in man, may be so understood as not to exclude his transcendence. Catholic belief in the immensity of God implies imminence of this kind. The principle of the divine concursus, or immediate cooperation of the deity in all the acts of finite beings, signifies that every effect flows from two causes, the infinite, or first, and the finite, or secondary cause. Divine imminence is also used to mean that God is in us, identical with our nature, and the sole principle or source of all our actions. Thus understood, imminence logically implies pantheism. The imminence theory in philosophy would reduce all reality to elements imminent or indwelling in consciousness. Both science and philosophy would thus be reduced to pure subjective experience. It is evident that the modernists' conception of religious experience was suggested by this philosophy of imminence, which has been elaborated by a group of recent German thinkers. By vital imminence, modernists understand an experience in our own consciousness of the underplay, if I may so speak, of the three imminent elements, God, religious sentiment, and the need of the divine. The subconscious. The phrase, the threshold of consciousness, has obtained great vogue in modern psychology. We know that a stimulus applied to the sense of touch, for instance, at any part of the human body, must have a certain strength or intensity in order to produce a conscious sensation. When the feeling first comes into clear consciousness, does it suddenly spring up there, or has it been gradually and continuously gathering strength in the soul until it stands out vividly in our inner experience? The latter is a view favoured by modern psychologists. Hence, if, figuratively speaking, we assume a line of demarcation below which a mental state is not consciously felt, and above which it is, the term threshold of consciousness will be an appropriate name for it. Below the threshold of consciousness, therefore, is the region of our subconscious life, of vital processes that are intensely real, but which, so long as they remain thus, cannot be known and investigated by us. Another term used in this connection is subliminal, limen being the Latin for threshold. As attention moves away, writes Professor J. Ward in his essay on psychology, from a presentation, it is intensively diminished, and when the presentation is below the threshold of consciousness, its intensity is then subliminal, whatever that of the physical stimulus may be. Professor Angel, in his Psychology, says, To the activity of the subconscious we are probably indebted for many of our unreasoned impressions and sentiments, for many of our unexpected ideas, for certain of our unreflective movements, especially those of the habitual variety. Not a few of our personal preferences and prejudices are probably referable to influences originating here. Such phenomena as those of automatic writing with the planchette, where a person may write considerable numbers of words without any clear idea of what is being written, belong to the borderline of influences lying between the subconscious and the unconscious. Taken all in all, subconscious factors must go to make up a very respectable portion of our total personality, and, no doubt, are accountable for many of the characteristics which sometimes cause us to wonder at ourselves and question whether or not we really have the kind of character we supposed. Virtual intention, in the treatise on human acts, may, we think, be similarly explained. Faith in God arises, according to the modernist, from a stimulation of the religious sentiment, the stimulus being our need of the divine. The religious sentiment first slumbers in the subliminal or subconscious self. Its activity, when appropriately stimulated, rises above the threshold of consciousness 
our religious experience begins, and although God, imminent in us, is unknown and unknowable by our reason, the religious sentiment, in some mystical manner, comprehends him with a conviction and certainty far greater, if we are to accept the gratuitous assertion of the modernists, than that which is produced by scientific demonstration. The theory that the religious sentiment can directly and immediately, and not discursively, or by deductive reasoning, enjoy an intuition of God, is evidently borrowed from the system of the ontologists, who teach that we can see God face to face by our natural powers. Need of the Divine There are two diametrically opposed views of the nature of progress. According to one, which is the older, we advance because we have in our minds an idea, however vague, of some end, goal or purpose, which we want to reach. Life is believed to be a chain of means and ends under the control and direction of one supreme purpose or goal, which gives value and direction to all intermediate activities. According to the other, which is the newer, we go forward because our present situation is disorganised, unsatisfactory and painful to our feelings. In other words, because of some need which urges us to activity in order to overcome existing friction and reorganise the discordant elements imminent in our present consciousness. This view of progress has been derived from the theory of evolution, which repudiates teleology or design. Just as the advocates of evolution deny that God created finite things and determined their growth and development according to ideas pre-existing in the divine mind, prototypal ideas, as they have been called, so also they reject the notion that social, economic or scientific progress has been due to any definite ends or aims which men propose to themselves, and ascribe the onward march of humanity to an impulse of no nobler character than that which urges a man to seek shelter from a storm, to seek food when he is hungry, or to lie down when he is fatigued. Hence, other factors being equal, where there is greater need, there will be greater activity and more marked progress. Natives of tropical countries, who have few needs and find, for these, satisfaction at hand, are static and indolent, while peoples of northern climes are sturdy and ambitious, ever discovering new methods of controlling the forces of nature, because they have to maintain an inexorable struggle for existence amidst unfavourable conditions of soil and climate. The progress of dogma, according to modernists, has been due to the assaults of heresy. According to the evolutionary theory of progress, movement is a tergo, or from behind. According to the Christian view, it is a fronte, or from an end, idea, purpose, or goal projected into the future, and constantly alluring us onward and upward. In other words, we are pursuing an ideal, but ideals are abhorred by evolutionists. In the case of the individual, it seems to us that both factors of progress, the teleological, or ideal, and the evolutionary one of exigencies, or wants, play their part. It is a question to be solved by a knowledge of character, which of the two factors predominates. The modernists attribute the origin and growth of religious experience, faith and revelation to a vital need of the divine. The word vital signifies a growing, changing, imminent process. Consequently our inner experience and faith in revelation are not different from our other vital processes, but are constantly developing by assimilation and elimination. The immutability, therefore, of dogma is a delusion from the modernists' standpoint. This theory is radically different from the development of dogma as explained by Newman and advocated by some of the greatest minds in the Catholic Church. They teach that the revelation given by God to man was completed in the apostolic age, but that the infallible magisterium of the Church emphasises now one part, now another, of the content of the deposit of faith, according to the necessity of the times. The modernists' theory must not be confounded with the dialectical or logical evolution of dogma, 
handed down from age to age by theologians who by analysis and reflection are constantly bringing into explicit view aspects of christian truth logically implied in previous formulas suggestion suggestion is another word that modern psychology has made extremely popular every person is supposed to possess some degree of suggestibility or capacity to be influenced by others hypnotic suggestion is its extreme form we distinctly feel the influence of suggestion whenever we associate with a strong personality its effect is to arrest the ordinary train of our ideas to check and obstruct our habitual modes of action professor baldwin distinguishes the following varieties of suggestion among the many distinguishable phases of suggestion apart from hypnosis which illustrates them all are one sensory motor suggestion movement due to a suggested sensation two ideo motor suggestion movement due to a suggested idea three motor suggestion as such direct suggestion of movement four sensory suggestion the suggestion of sensory experience for example that a red light is green five ideal suggestion suggestion of thoughts beliefs etc six personality suggestion the peculiar suggestive influence of persons as such seven contrary suggestion the production of effects actions notably the contrary of those properly due to what is suggested eight negative suggestion or suggestive inhibition the removal of something from consciousness by suggestion nine organic suggestion the successful suggestion of organic effects ten hysterical suggestion the suggestive conditions of hysteria eleven social suggestion the normal acceptance of hints or more than hints from the social milieu twelve imitative suggestion suggestibility to models and copies of all sorts for imitation modernists have recourse to suggestion to explain the twofold value of dogmas proclaimed orally or in writing by means of it these awaken a religious experience once actual but now dormant in an individual and also generate it for the first time in the soul of a person possessing the proper moral dispositions dualism the tendency to reduce things to ultimate principles which are independent and opposed to each other is called dualism the tendency to find gradations between contraries or to reduce them to a more fundamental principle in which their opposition and apparent contradiction become reconciled or unified is called monism at the present time there is a strong bias in the world of thought against all forms of dualism like so many other features of the spirit of the age monism received its influence from kant he appeared in the history of philosophy as mediator between the scepticism of hume and the dogmatism of leibniz and wolf no two systems could be more diametrically opposed and yet the philosopher of Königsberg professed to have discovered a more profound principle which reconciled scepticism and dogmatism hence since the days of kant the mediation of opposites may be said to have become a favorite philosophical method the assumption that every error is a half-truth was modified into the assumption that opposing and contradictory theories or hypotheses can be conciliated by mediation that is by the discovery of a higher principle which advances beyond both and embodies the element of value contained in each of them hegel carrying kant's assumptions to what he conceived to be their inevitable logical conclusions rejected the principle of contradiction maintaining the identity of being and not being how far the modernists have been influenced by this suicidal hypothesis of hegel may be seen in their assertion that the greatest honour we can offer the deity is to ascribe contradictory attributes to him there are various forms of dualism a theological dualism appears in the zoroastrian religion with its opposition of ahriman the evil one and ormuzd 
the good one. Zoroastrian dualism, in the Christian era, reappeared in the form of the Manichaean heresy. b. Anthropological dualism is the system which proclaims the body and soul to be essentially distinct in essence. c. Soteriological dualism explains the scheme of salvation by distinguishing between God as a principle transcending the universe and man as his creature whom he, of his own free will, redeems. d. Sociological dualism is found in the distinction between the church and state, between the laity and the clergy, between the absolute monarch and his subjects. e. Finally, the dualism between faith and science is especially an object of detestation to modernists. Although they proclaim that each has its own province, that faith deals with noumena and science with phenomena, yet they hold that man cannot abide a dualism and insist on harmonising the two. The method which they approve of as alone satisfactory is to subject faith to the control of science. End of Part 1 of Appendix to Encyclical Letter Pascendi Dominici Gregis On the Errors of the Modernists Section 5 of Pascendi Dominici Gregis On the Errors of the Modernists by Pope St. Pius X Translated by Thomas E. Judge This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 2 to Appendix to Encyclical Letter Pascendi Dominici Gregis On the Errors of the Modernists Pragmatism Pragmatism is a system of philosophy, or rather an attitude assumed towards the whole world of thought and reality, which values everything by its practical effects. All knowledge is related to action as means to end. Hence, the old ideal of pursuing knowledge for its own sake is derided as a mere will-o'-the-wisp or mere fata morgana, the pursuit of which leads us far away from the true, the beautiful and the good. Its test, or standard, of the value of any principle or system is the practical difference. Its acceptance, or non-acceptance, will involve the individual and the race. No philosophical theory was ever more vague than this very vagueness, while it commends it to many persons of conflicting philosophical and theological leanings, renders it also inane and useless. Not even the doctrine of the Blessed Trinity, which would seem to be, of all others, the most remote from our practical concerns, can be said to be without some practical effects. But the general disposition of the masses is to define the word practical in a very narrow sense, and restrict its application to secular concerns. The popularity of the theory is, in this country, especially unfortunate. Indeed, pragmatism may be said to be a philosophical statement of the predominant motives that have influenced the people of the United States in the course of their history, and especially of those that have shaped our present industrial organization. Pragmatism, as applied by the modernists, means an interpretation, or rather evaluation, of the truths of the Christian religion by their bearing on moral conduct. Stripped of its nebulous verbiage and boldly viewed, it is identical with the principle that the end justifies the means. How opposed it is to the entire Christian scheme may be inferred from the emphasis which the Church has always laid on the distinction between things that are intrinsically good and things that are intrinsically bad. For instance, she has always taught that no motive or reason can excuse a lie, since, of its inmost character, a lie is opposed to the divine nature, which is truth itself. But no consistent pragmatist can refuse to endorse lying when the balance of results would be beneficial. Pragmatism, in any form, is clearly incompatible with belief in the existence of an absolutely perfect God, for an all-holy one is an unchangeable standard of truth and right. The results, therefore, of doctrine in its effect on human conduct are of secondary importance. 
pragmatism, or the deification of success, or valuation by results, is opposed to a belief in the absolute and makes all things relative, like agnosticism and positivism. It is interesting to trace the connection between pragmatism and the theory of selective attention. It is beyond question that we merely attend to that which is of special interest and therefore, in some sense, of practical value to us. Under how many almost totally different aspects will the same object be considered by persons with different interests? The flower, to the botanist, is a specimen that illustrates certain scientific principles of growth and classification. To the aesthete, it is an object of beauty. To the florist, it is an article for sale. The same person will appeal to the lawyer merely as a client, to the politician as a voter, to the clergyman as a member of his congregation, to the tailor as a customer, etc. This theory of selective attention has been carried to such an extreme that some of its advocates hold that we not merely determine by selective attention what will dominate for the time our consciousness, but that we thereby, as it were, create reality. In other words, we make things exist by the process of directing attention to them. Of course, it is true that, practically speaking, only those things exist for us in which we have an interest and to which, consequently, we direct attention. But the assumption that our thinking gives objects reality is one of those wild and sophistical speculations which serve to discredit philosophy in the eyes of thousands. The hypothesis underlying pragmatism is precisely the same as that underlying the extravagant theory of selective attention. Objects, or truths, are assumed to have no reality except that which they have for us. Consequently, the criterion of truth, goodness and beauty, which pragmatism espouses, is the following. Consider if, and how far, your interests are affected and the answer will determine the whole value of the proposition under investigation. Dogma It will be interesting, and instructive, to examine in some detail how the modernists apply their principles in explaining the nature and development of dogma. In this part I shall follow closely the lead of La Pietonniere, who has published two excellent articles in the September and October numbers of Annales de philosophie chrétienne, as part of a review of Monsieur Leroy's well-known volume Dogme et Critique. A prejudice exists in the minds of many persons, at the present time, against dogmatic religion. Leroy ascribes its origin to what he calls the intellectualist conception. The characteristic of intellectualism, which has been already explained, is that it regards as secondary and derived the moral and practical meaning of dogma, while it proclaims the intellectual or theoretical sense to be its essential or constitutive element. But dogma, thus viewed, is, according to modernists, of its very nature incapable of verification and unthinkable. Perhaps it may be said that, though intrinsically incapable of verification, it has extrinsic evidence in its favour, and appeals effectually to the human mind in the name of authority. In this hypothesis, it would enslave the human spirit, which imperiously demands freedom, independence, and autonomy. Neither religious doctrine nor moral obligation should be considered as having a transcendent origin or as coming to us from without, but as pullulating or springing from our own nature. The transcendent hypothesis according to the modernists, would place an intolerable yoke upon the human mind. Leroy proceeds to subject certain dogmas to critical examination in the light of the intellectualist conception, for the purpose of showing that, thus interpreted, they are a mere mirage that deceives our mental vision. Take, for example, the dogma of the personality of God. If we interpret it according to ordinary intellectual standards, or, in other words, experience, we shall fall into anthropomorphism. For what is our notion of personality in last analysis? A man is said to be a person because he is sui juris, or self-conscious, 
and exercises control over his thoughts and volitions. But we cannot apply this concept, which is derived from our own psychological experience, to God, without reducing him to the level of man. May we not say, however, that the divine personality is incomparable and transcendent, that no term can be predicated univocally, but only analogically, of God and finite beings. But Leroy holds that any form of analogy consists in establishing a resemblance between God and creatures, in attributing the perfections of the finite to the infinite, in thinking of the deity in terms of human qualities, and consequently cannot escape anthropomorphism. A dogma of a different type is the resurrection of Christ. From it especially, the modernists elaborate their theory of faith and religious knowledge. By the resurrection, we mean that, having passed through the gates of death, our Saviour, Jesus Christ, returned to life on earth. But no Christian holds that he came back to life in the same form of existence that was his before his death. After his resurrection, he had a glorified body. The word life, therefore, is applied to Christ in one sense before his death and in another after his resurrection. The two meanings are incommensurable. One comes within the scope of our experience, the other does not. How then can we say that the word life in the second sense has any meaning for pure reason? Footnote. The assumption throughout is that our knowledge is entirely empirical, that we can only know what enters into our experience, namely phenomena. This principle they take from Kant's agnosticism. End footnote. It is, says Leroy, a metaphor inconvertible into definite ideas. We can only interpret it by introducing elements which belong to human life as we ordinarily experience it, and as Christ possessed it before his body was glorified. What distinguishes the dogma of the resurrection from others is that, instead of being expressed merely in symbolic language, behind which would lie concealed a reality unknowable and unthinkable by us, it purports to present a fact that occurred in space and time, and that entered into the drama of historical events at a given moment and manifested itself to the sight, touch and hearing of man. Must we not, therefore, consider it as an historical event, the reality of which has been historically demonstrated? But, says Leroy, the resurrection, as a passage to a glorious life, is unthinkable, because it does not come within the range of experience. It should therefore be eliminated from the domain of thought, because it was eliminated from the domain of experience. In order that the resurrection could be an object of observation, like all other facts of experience, Christ should have resumed his former life by the reanimation of his dead body. But, says Leroy, the resurrection, as an article of Catholic faith, is different from this. It means the entrance into glory and the transition to the supernatural order of existence, so that the body attributed to Christ after the resurrection had nothing in common with the bodies which constitute the world of our experience. What then can we understand by the reality of a glorified body? That is to say, of a body withdrawn from the system of space and time relations, which constitutes the very notion of physical reality. Hence it may be well to call attention to Monsieur Leroy's peculiar theory of the nature of body. He regards it, not as an isolated portion of the world around us, a reality existing independently of others, but as a centre of coordination having physical continuity with the whole universe, so that the reality of a body is constituted by its bonds with the aggregate of material things. From the scientific standpoint, he argues that if the resurrection of Christ were a space and a time phenomenon, it would destroy the very conditions of the existence of the material universe. For since bodies have no reality, except through the bonds or ties that unite them to the whole, a break in their continuity or uniformity, the hypothesis that Christ's glorified body, which had no space and time relation, was identical with his original body, would leave only the disjecta membra of a world. 
the supernatural may indeed intervene in the world of physical reality, but grace does not act in the bosom of nature except by clothing itself in nature's own, and not in glorified or supernatural forms. Leroy does not mean to deny the reality of the resurrection, but he relegates it to another and higher order than the phenomenal order of facts occurring in space and time. We ought, he says, to accept a dogma on the word of God who has revealed it, and not because of its historical evidence. Modernists contend that the apparitions, even if we assume that they were not hallucinations pure and simple, should be regarded as the effect of the spiritual manifestation of Christ, giving evidence of his survival in glory, and should not be taken as a resumption of his terrestrial life. It is worthy of note that Christ appeared only to his disciples, and not to the general body of the Jews, from which Leroy seems to infer, influenced probably by Ronan's theory, that it was the very anterior faith and love of the apostles which objectivized the image of Christ already enshrined in their imaginations and in their hearts. From the discrepancies in the gospel narratives of the resurrection, Leroy concludes that the narratives are legendary and imaginary, in conformity with the habits of thought that prevailed in their environment. The risen Christ is not, therefore, an outer experience, or rather, he is only an object of religious experience. If the Apostle's vision of him be called perception, the term should be qualified so as to read religious perception. What is historically true is that the Apostles really believed that Christ had returned to life after having visited Hades, the reality, therefore, with which the New Testament deals is psychological, but not extramental. The apparition should be regarded as an evidence of faith, and not as an evidence of facts. Leroy's criticism, therefore, comes to this. There exists only one order of knowledge in the speculative sense, while there are two orders of reality which, so far as we are concerned, are absolutely separated and incommensurable. The phenomenal order, which, coming within the range of our experience, is the object of our concepts and our theories, and the noumenal order, which, being wholly foreign to our experience, note that Leroy confounds the noumenal and the supernatural orders, is also beyond the reach of thought, and, consequently, theoretically unknowable. A dogma, therefore, is utterly unknowable, except in the practical sense as conveying a moral precept. Is Leroy an agnostic? Against this charge he defends himself strenuously. He maintains that there exists a necessary relation between dogma and thought, and that it is once a right and a duty not to rest satisfied with blind faith. But what relation can there be between dogmas and thought, if the dogmas are unknowable? To answer this question, he distinguishes the believer as a believer and the believer as a philosopher. To this distinction corresponds two aspects of thought equally possible, equally legitimate, and even equally necessary. The one is essentially practical, and the other essentially speculative. This distinction runs through the entire system of Leroy. The believer should not consider the dogmatic formula as literally expressing a reality, but as conveying what we should do or how we should comport ourselves in dealing with this reality. The dogma, thus viewed, while remaining theoretically unknowable, inasmuch as it is transcendent reality, becomes practically thinkable under the form of conduct which it commands. In this way, dogma enters into our experience, since we must live it, and the relations between the human mind and religious truth, which appear to be definitely broken off, are restored. We escape agnosticism without relapsing into intellectualism, which would create an invincible discord between science and dogma. According to this interpretation, dogma gives an orientation to all the modes of our activity. Pragmatism takes the places of agnosticism, and the Catholic is merely restricted by rules of conduct, and not by mere theories or ideas. Dogmas, says Leroy, are not merely enigmatic and nebulous formulae, 
which God promulgated in order to check the pride of our spirit, they have a moral and practical sense. They have a vital meaning, more or less accessible, to us according to the degree of spirituality which we have attained. What, according to this view, are we to understand by the dogmas? God is personal. Jesus is risen. Something apparently very simple and within the reach of everybody. God is personal conveys to us the practical command. In all your relations with God, act as you would in your relations with a human person. Similarly, Jesus is risen means, in your relations to him, shape your conduct as you would have shaped it before his death, as you would now shape it in dealing with one of your contemporaries. Thus we have come to understand and appreciate Christianity as a source and rule of life, a discipline of moral and religious action, instead of regarding it with the intellectualists as a system of speculative philosophy. Yet Leroy will not consent to be classified with those who hold that Christianity is a mere ethical system, however sublime. The positive dogmas it contains have primarily a practical meaning, and instead of deriving this from their theoretical interpretation, he derives the latter from the former. Dogma, he says, is a thought action, and it is in action, and in the measure in which we act, that we understand it. The most efficacious means of determining its significance is to compel oneself to live it. Faith in the resurrection was a point of departure, and the principle of the greatest achievements which the human soul has accomplished. It has accumulated, during the career of its marvellous sway, an inexhaustible and abiding profundity. The apparitions were mental constructions, true hallucinations, if the expression be permissible. In the order of religion, as well as in the scientific order, that which establishes the value of a mental construction, that which distinguishes it from pathological hallucination, even though both be produced by the same mechanism, and be accompanied by the same nervous changes, is intensity of life and the resistance which they offer to the corroding influences of time. Pathological hallucination, on the other hand, reveals a lowering of vitality and yields to the dissolving influences which it successively encounters. Viewed in this light, the apparitions of Jesus by the Apostles have been an experience which faith itself established in the depths of the subliminal or subconscious self, and by which it entered into a genuine relation with the mysterious living reality corresponding to it. Themselves the product of a previously existing faith, the apparitions reacted on this faith, strengthened, enriched, and developed it, and something corresponds to it in the absolute reality. By anterior faith, M. Leroy evidently understands a sort of implicit faith, the object of which the apparitions have been at once the means of finding, and in finding, of making explicit and definite. They were a mode of realizing the resurrection relative and adapted to the capacity of the disciples, to their degree of culture, and to the prevailing conceptions of their time and environment. By reason of the mental condition of the period, they could not think of the resurrection except by means of a certain theory of matter and life which today is obsolete. For them, the resurrection meant the reanimation of a corpse, and the reanimation implied apparitions. Thence they deduced that the corpse must have disappeared from the place where it was laid, and if, in reality, on inspection of the tomb, the body could not be discovered, we must recognize that its removal was providential in order that the evidence of the tomb should corroborate the apparitions. All this shows the contingent character of the apparitions. They served provisionally as a means of expressing the faith, and were destined to disappear like other forms of the same kind, such as the descent into hell and the ascension conceived as implying locations in space. In these, today, the most conservative see only the husks of a faith which defines itself according to popular categories. But it is not the images and concepts by which the resurrection expresses itself that are important. It is the underlying spiritual reality which these images and concepts symbolize and which, 
thus comprehended, gave to human life an orientation that has transformed it. In this consists truly and essentially the dogma which claims our assent. Therefore, in all cases the dogmatic formulae should be interpreted in terms of practical or moral action, and not in technical or speculative language. We must look not for theories, but for directions. But this does not prevent us from having the right, and even the duty, of constructing, as far as possible, theories or interpretations of the reality corresponding to dogma. We cannot avoid doing so, since speculative thought is part of our concrete life. Monsieur Leroy says that faith cannot be radically separated even from theoretical thought, for it is destined to expand into the beatific vision of which it is an anticipation and a germ, and not a heterogeneous form of exchange for the object which it purchases. Moreover, it is impossible for faith to keep clear of science and philosophy, because the human mind is one and abhors dualism. He even admits that dogmas have a philosophic value and that one can regard them as speculative propositions. We must think and express our faith, and for that purpose we must have recourse to ideas and words. Faith, therefore, must think itself in terms of all the systems of philosophy with which it comes in contact, either to harmonize itself with them, or to detach itself from them. Otherwise there would be the necessity of maintaining a double consciousness. Thus arise theological systems, which must not be confounded with the experiences of faith. They have the same role as theories in science, namely, to coordinate the results attained and to suggest new lines of research. Theology, therefore, is the philosophy of faith, which it aims at assimilating by means of speculative thought. Dogma is not merely an object for the contemplation of the mind, material offered to the mind statically, it is dynamic, and what we should consider in the images and in the concepts is this dynamic character, the movement which pervades them and which carries the mind incessantly from an inadequate symbol to a better one. And as a movement is only thoroughly known in its progress, so to perceive the truth of a dogma we must endeavour to live it. The dogma gives to the mind a speculative impulse in submitting to it a problem to be solved. Theological theories always have for their aim to clothe the data of faith with the forms of reason. Monsieur Leroy evidently means that at each epoch dogma should accommodate itself to the philosophy and science of that period. It does not draw its true value from such accommodation, but it should express itself theoretically in terms of contemporary philosophy and science. The believer is bound not to attack the essential element of faith, which is the attitude commanded by the dogma. With this reservation, it is his right, and even his duty, to employ the science and the philosophy of his time in adapting the formula of the dogma to the intellectual spirit of the age. This intellectualization of dogma at a given moment, or its expression in terms of science and philosophy, is as variable as a scientific theory or philosophical system. In this way, Monsieur Leroy attempts to show us how one can give a philosophical thinkable idea of the resurrection. In rejecting the reanimation of Christ's corpse, it is only a certain idea of the resurrection, and not its reality, he says, that he rejects. He repudiates the mythical theory, and also the symbolical theory, which would make of the resurrection a mere symbol of immortality. Christ not only survives in the memory of his followers and in the influence he exerts on their lives, but he lives by his presence in our midst. Between the resurrection and the Eucharistic presence there is a close connection. This presence cannot be phenomenal, that is, it does not belong to the sensible order. But how can it be real and yet not phenomenal? To answer this question, Leroy has recourse to a new theory of matter, he is an idealist. Matter, he holds, exists only in the mind and relatively to it. He distinguishes between pure matter, which is a need or exigency of the spirit, to reduce itself to a mechanism and contract habits, an actual matter which has an explicit and concrete reality. 
Actual matter is a product of the mind, of the group of mechanisms which it has created, and the system of habits which it has contracted, as a necessary condition of its action. Nevertheless, this matter is social and hereditary. It is a bond of the monads and the result of their collective action, and, far from being something subjective to each individual, is born in the midst of pre-existing matter, which truly limits and conditions it. But matter, for the most part, has fallen into unconsciousness and automatism. It is thus an obstacle to the liberty of the spirit, which, by right, should be sovereign, and human progress consists in gradually freeing the spirit from its trammels. This being so, we can easily understand what death means, or the cessation of practical activity and phenomenal disappearance. Death occurs when we abandon the point in which we are in contact with, and, as it were, embedded in matter. Then the mechanism which composed the body, having fallen off from the soul, dissolves, little by little, into the common mass of nameless things, whose only function is inertia. But the soul is not thereby totally disembodied. It bears with it its own body, which is pure matter, which means that the soul retains the power of reconstituting mechanisms more or less similar to those it has lost, and, consequently, to play a new role in the sensible world. Thus it is explained how it can afterwards return to life. For this it is sufficient that the pure matter retained should realise itself, that its power should pass to act in order that it may resume life and reappear in the phenomenal order. This will be a resurrection in its own flesh. The body is the same after as before, because it has, as its principle, the same germ. Everything takes place as in ordinary vital phenomena of assimilation and elimination. But this would be merely a natural resurrection, a resumption of phenomenal life, and what we are endeavouring to conceive is a supernatural resurrection, which implies the assumption of a glorified body. The point of contact at which the soul comes into relationship with the whole universe is its body, which, in a sense, is the universe. If, in the natural state, a living body detaches itself from universal continuity, it is because, through automatism and unconsciousness, its practical power of direct action and reaction is localised at the point in which its life remains conscious and autonomous. For the most part it remains a mere potentiality, which slumbers or acts habitually, blindly, and mechanically. But when the conscious subject conquers the unconscious, when liberty triumphs over automatism, then the appearances of limitation and disconnection vanish. The body ceases to be externally visible as an object among other objects. It exists in the fullness of its being, and that, which was before only slumbering potentiality, has become actuality and reality. There is no longer any frontier marking the spot to which this potentiality is confined. It is a centre of perception and initiative everywhere. It has become a glorious body. It has realised the perfect unfolding of its potentiality. It has the entire universe for the scene of its immediate activity and lives no longer in mechanical inertia and subliminal penumbra, but in light and liberty. Behold how the presence of the living Christ can be sovereignly real without being apparent. It only ceases to be visible because it has become supremely real. The resurrection, thus conceived, is an animation of the entire universe by Christ, which necessarily implies a supernatural presence, a presence that is not included in the phenomenal order. A natural resurrection would have consisted in reproducing certain mechanisms, that is, in resuming the appearances of limitation and disconnection, which render an ordinary body perceptible as a distinct object of the phenomenal world, while the resurrection of Christ has been a victory over all that, a complete escape from automatism and unconsciousness, in order to act in the fullness of light and liberty. By the solidarity which binds us and all nature to him, the resurrection has become for us and for all nature at once a pledge and a means of a similar triumph. In order that this seed of glory should develop and fructify, 
we have only to nourish our souls by participation more and more in the life of Christ through faith and the sacraments, especially the Holy Eucharist. The resurrection is a permanent fact dominating time and space, indissolubly bound to the Eucharist and the Church, and not a mere transitory fact of a particular place and a particular moment. Dogma, understood in its practical sense, is immediately within the reach of everybody. It is not necessary to be a scientist or a philosopher in order to assent to it. There is no danger of humanity becoming thereby divided into two castes, of which one would be charged with the duty of elaborating ideas which the others could only slavishly accept. Moreover, this view of dogma leaves intact the liberty of the spirit and its undeniable right to reject every conception which would impose itself from without. Recourse to authority, totally objectionable in the order of thought, is permissible in the sphere of action. Liberty, having no place and no role in the steps of discursive thought, authority could not affect that I should find an argument, solid or weak, that such or such a notion should convey a particular meaning to my mind. I do not say merely, says Leroy, that it is not right, but that the process is radically impossible, for it is I who think, and not authority that thinks for me. But in the practical order, it is different. I am always free to take one attitude rather than another, but where liberty intervenes, authority can intervene. We can thus see, also, how the act of faith is free, as it should be. It is precisely because the dogma commands an act, and that its value verifies itself only in action, or in living the dogma, that faith is free. But one sees also how the autonomy of the spirit is safeguarded, since the dogmas, in so far as they are made known, present themselves as data for speculation, as matter for theories to be formed about, and not as a theory already formed. What facts are to science, dogmas are to theological speculation. Autonomy of the spirit is in perfect accord with the principle of submission to fact, and the most scrupulous and jealous autonomist cannot see any impediment to liberty of research in the necessity of admitting that facts judge theories. That which was repugnant in the intellectualist conception was that dogmas imposed solutions ready-made, binding the spirit from without, whilst in the present hypothesis they only present problems upon which the mind is called to exercise its activity freely. Thus understood, they no longer hamper scientific or philosophical speculation, but they become themselves objects of speculation. This speculation consists always in intellectualizing the dogma in terms of science and philosophy. It is variable and perfectible. The authority of the Church has no right to restrict it to this or that definite theory, but only to uphold the immutable element of dogma against the theories which misunderstand or misrepresent it. The Church is the guardian of the deposit of faith, and not of systems of philosophy and theology. By its dogmas, understood in the true sense, it is not obstructive of the movement of thought, but on the contrary, stimulates it by furnishing it with a new object. Has Monsieur Leroy truly removed the reproach of heteronomy, which modern philosophers have made against religion? The contradictions in which his theory abounds are too palpable to call for detailed exposure. Its exposition carries with it its own refutation. End of Part 2 of Appendix to Encyclical Letter Pascendi Dominici Gregis On the Errors of the Modernists Section 6 of Pascendi Dominici Gregis On the Errors of the Modernists by Pope St. Pius X Translated by Thomas E. Judge This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 3 of Appendix to Encyclical Letter Pascendi Dominici Gregis On the Errors of the Modernists Kant and the Modernists the modernists, relying on Kant's subjective method, which they call the method of immanence, 
hold that the Christian religion is credible because it best corresponds to the exigencies of our souls. Everything is explained by saying that truth is not transcendent and is not measured by its conformity with its object, but depends on man himself and develops by adaptation to his various needs. According to Kant, the great and necessary truths of religion appeal to the will, not to the intellect. All religion springs from our need of the infinite. Kant admits necessary truths as such. The principles of mathematics he considers unchangeable because they formulate the laws of space and time, which are subjective forms of our own senses. Our pure reason also imposes laws on nature, and the external universe, considered as cosmos, or orderly and organised whole, derives all its principles of organization from the human mind. Science, therefore, as such, or the general principles which we deduce from phenomena by means of the principle of causality, is a collection of laws imposed on the universe by our own minds, and their universality and force cannot be questioned by the sceptic, because we cannot consistently, with the constitution of our intellects, think the universe otherwise. Material bodies are a mere aggregation, or chaos. Similarly, the will imposes on the intellect principles that are necessary for life, necessary, that is, to regulate morality. They are free will, the immortality of the soul, and the existence of God. Kant also admits that religious faith may be accepted as an ideal solace, but he reduces it to myths and imaginary symbols. He recognises nothing else in the Bible and in the scriptural narrative of Jesus Christ himself except myths and symbols. By the word imminent was formerly meant a characteristic of vital actions which, of their own nature, are not terminated in an external effect, but remain in the subject himself, as his act and perfection. In the new school, imminence implies that from the subject is derived either in whole, or for the most part, the determining reason of the various acts of which his nature is capable, and this is to be understood not merely of the order of knowledge, but of the order of reality, and of the supernatural as well as of the natural order. Hence there is imminent in us not only the capacity to receive supernatural gifts, but also the active power, corresponding to supernatural elevation, to operate, by means of them, and even their determining reason, which is a natural need or exigency. This concept of imminence implies imminence of the higher forms and natures in the inferior, whence follows the natural evolution of one from the other. This philosophy of action and moral dogmatism is excellently refuted in a recent work by Rev. G. Matiussi. S.I. Il veleno canziano, nuova e antica critica della ragione. Errors of the Modernists concerning the origin of Christianity. Contrary to the Modernists' views, we Catholics hold that Christianity is not a subconscious and spontaneous evolution, that it is not an emanation from the religious consciousness of humanity, that it arises through a positive intervention of the gratuitous and miraculous condescension of God. It is constituted by the historical fact of the Incarnation. It is, essentially, a supernatural gift, an interior gift of grace which nourishes the Christian life, an external gift of the teaching and precepts of Christ, which entrusted to the Apostles is communicated to us by the Church and its infallible head. To the thesis of efference, which would have it arise from below, from the depths of human nature and the bowels of humanity, we radically oppose the thesis of afference, which affirms the specifically supernatural character of the dogmas and virtues of Catholicism and the gratuitousness of the entire Christian order. Footnote. The words efference and afference, by which the modernists contrast their system and intellectualism, are borrowed from the names of the efferent, outgiving or motor, and the afferent, 
in-carrying, or sensory, nerves. Afference implies that revelation comes to us from without, from a transcendent source. Efference from an imminent source. End footnote. Nor is it true that the human soul, even inspired by secret impulses from God, and actuated by grace from heaven, can arrive at a knowledge of dogma and of the whole supernatural order, for revelation alone can teach us that this order exists and what it is. We have an instinctive and profound abhorrence for the methods of those who try to establish harmony between philosophy and religion by minimising and compromising. Motives of Credibility Innocent XI condemned the following proposition. The supernatural ascent of faith necessary for salvation is compatible with merely probable knowledge of revelation, nay, even with doubt whether God has spoken. Our faith must be a rationabile obsequium, or reasonable service. We must have a rational certainty of the fact of revelation before we can give the assent of faith, that is, assent to a revealed doctrine, based on the authority of God, who has revealed it. The reasons which prove the fact of revelation, or that the proposition is really the word of God, are called motives of credibility. The whole attitude of the mind, in an act of faith, may be interpreted in the form of a syllogism. Whatever God says is true. But God has said that the church is infallible. Therefore it is true that the church is infallible. The motive that makes us assent to the major premise is the motive of faith. The reason, or reasons that make us assent to the minor premise, are motives of credibility. They establish the fact of revelation. The rationalists, among other things, deny that it is possible to be certain of the fact of revelation. The modernists, like some Protestants, substitute inward feelings, or inward religious experience, for external signs or proofs of the fact of revelation. The true Catholic position is easily understood from the following definition of the Vatican Council. In order that the submission of our faith might be in accordance with reason, God hath willed to give us, together with the internal assistance of the Holy Ghost, external proofs of his revelation, namely, divine facts, and above all, miracles and prophecies, which, while they clearly manifest God's almighty power and infinite knowledge, are most certain divine signs of revelation adapted to the understanding of all men. Wherefore Moses, and all the prophets, and especially Christ our Lord himself, wrought and uttered many and most manifest miracles and prophecies, and, touching the apostles, we read, They, going forth, preached the word everywhere, the Lord working with all, and confirming the word with the signs that followed. And again it is written, We have the more firm prophetical word, whereunto you do well to attend, as to a light that shineth in a dark place. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 19 But in order that we may fulfil the duty of embracing the true faith, and of persevering therein constantly, God, by means of his only begotten Son, hath instituted the church, and hath endowed her with plain marks, whereby she may be recognised by all men as the guardian and mistress of the revealed word. For to the Catholic Church alone belong all the wonders which have been divinely arranged for the evident credibility of the Christian faith. Moreover, the Church herself, by her wonderful propagation, exalted sanctity and unbounded fertility in all that is good, by her Catholic unity and invincible stability, is both an enduring motive of credibility and an unimpeachable testimony of her divine mission. Whence it is that, like a standard set up unto the nations, Isaiah chapter 11, verse 12, she calleth to her them that have not yet believed, and maketh her children certain that the faith which they profess resteth on the surest foundation. Session 3, Chapter 3 The Catholic Church, therefore, 
recognizes an internal factor of our assent to the fact of revelation, namely the assistance of the Holy Ghost, and also external signs, namely divine facts, especially miracles and prophecies. Consequently, the Church has been invested by Christ with plain notes or marks, whereby she may be recognized by all men as the guardian and mistress of revelation. Catholics, therefore, recognize the value of inner experiences in begetting certainty of revelation. But they do not regard these inner experiences as the soul, or even the most important factors in producing this certainty, as the modernists do. For these inner experiences are subjective that is, restricted to the person who feels them, and liable to illusion, while the faith is proposed by public authority and exacts public and universal obedience. It must, therefore, be supported by public and plain signs of its divine origin. The following quotation from Schieben's Dogmatique, translated by Wilhelm and Scannell, is very instructive. Although, in theory, it would be conceivable that it was only the first promulgators of the faith who had their mission attested by divine signs, and that this fact should have been handed down to us in the same way as any other historical event. Nevertheless, as a matter of fact, and as might be expected from the nature of faith and revelation, God has ordained that the signs or criteria of divine origin should uninterruptedly accompany the preaching of his doctrine. The fact of revelation is thereby brought home to us in a more lively, direct and effective manner. The question is of the greatest importance at the present time, when the divine mission of even Christ himself is the object of so many attacks. When the divine mission of the Church was denied, and thereby the existence of a continual living testimony was rejected, faith in the divine mission of Christ thenceforth rested upon merely historical evidence, and so became the prey of historical criticism. Besides, without a continuous divine approbation, Christ's mission becomes such an isolated fact that its full significance cannot be grasped. Some Catholic theologians, in their endeavours to defend Christianity and the Church on purely historical grounds, have not given enough prominence to the constant signs of divine approbation, which have accompanied the Church's preaching in all ages. The Vatican definition has, therefore, been most opportune. It is now of faith that the Church herself is an enduring motive of credibility and an unimpeachable testimony of her divine mission. Her wonderful propagation, in spite of the greatest moral and physical difficulties, not only in her early years, but even at the present day. Her eminent sanctity, as manifested in her saints, combined with their miracles. Her inexhaustible fertility in every sort of good work. Her unity in faith, discipline and worship. Her invincible constancy in resisting the attacks of powerful enemies within and without for more than 18 centuries. All these are manifest signs that she is not the work of man, but the work of God. Tradition The entire Church is the mystical body of Christ, compacted by God, and directed and vivified by the Holy Spirit. The Church is, therefore, a unique society. Its judgment is the judgment of the Holy Spirit, and the truth of the testimony of its witnesses does not depend upon their number, but upon the office which they hold in the Church and the prerogatives which are attached to that office by divine right. Ecclesiastical tradition, therefore, has a divine and a human element, and differs from all other kinds of tradition in the degree and character of the certainty that it produces. But we should not forget that owing to the human element there may be a break in the continuity and universality of the tradition and a temporary or partial eclipse of the truth. The great truths of Christianity have always been expressly taught in the Church, considered as a whole. Others of less fundamental character have been implicitly contained in those that were distinctly professed, and by reflection, 
and the direction of the Holy Spirit could be easily deduced for universal acceptance. This logical, or dialectical, evolution of dogma is very different from the vital evolution advocated by modernists, who teach that the new dogmatic formulae are not contained in the old, which have grown obsolete, but are substituted for them in the changing conditions of their environment, because new ones become necessary as being better adapted to the vital need of the believer. If a doctrine be defined by the supreme magisterium of the church, it becomes a part of the universal ecclesiastical tradition, but even then, the definition is always based on the fact that the tradition in question was universal for a long time. The ordinary channels of tradition are 1. The entire church, head and members. Unanimity of faith may be gathered from professions of faith universally accepted, from catechisms in general use, and from the general practice of the church in her liturgy, discipline or morals, so far as these imply doctrinal truths. It is an old axiom, legem credendi statuat lex orandi. 2. The consent of the faithful, namely, the distinct, universal and constant profession of a doctrine by the whole body of the simple faithful. Thus, before the definition of the Immaculate Conception, the profession and practice of the faithful were appealed to in favour of it. The late Dr. Murray of Maynooth College, in his famous treatise De Ecclesia, has the following passage. As the blood flows from the heart to the body through the arteries, as the vital sap insinuates itself into the whole tree, into each bough and leaf and fibre, as water descends through a thousand channels from the mountain top to the plain, so is Christ's pure and life-giving doctrine diffused, flowing into the whole body through a thousand organs from the Ecclesia Dorsens. 3. The testimony of all the bishops, because the episcopate is the chief organ of infallibility in the church. 4. The perfect representative of tradition, the apostolic see. Moreover, as a consequence of the connection between the head of the church and the Roman see, there exists in the local Roman church, apart from the authoritative decisions of the Pope, a certain actual and normal testimony, which must be considered as an expression of the habitual teaching of the Holy See. The faith professed in the Roman Church is the result of the constant teachings of the Popes, accepted by the laity and taught by the clergy, especially by the College of Cardinals, who take part in the general government of the Church. The external channels are 1. The Testimony of the Fathers In the early days of the Church, when the teaching functions were almost exclusively exercised by the bishops, the extraordinary representatives of apostolic tradition were usually eminent members of the episcopate. They were called Fathers of the Church, because living as they did in the infancy of the Church, when extraordinary means were needed for its preservation, they received a more abundant outpouring of the gifts of the Holy Ghost, and thus their doctrine represents his teaching in an eminent degree. 2. Doctors of the Church, distinguished for human learning and industry, which they applied to the development and fuller comprehension of doctrine, rather than to the fixing of its substance. Documentary tradition is the expression of the oral and living tradition and the Holy Ghost assists in the production and preservation of such documents so that they may present a more or less perfect representation of previous tradition. The writings of the Fathers constitute a written tradition equal in authority to the subsequent oral tradition and are an objective rule of faith running side by side with oral tradition, but their authority is dependent on the Church. Official documents comprise decisions of the popes and councils, liturgical documents and monuments, such as liturgies, sacramentaries, ordines romani, pictures, symbols, inscriptions, vases, etc., connected with public worship. All these participate, more or less, in the supernatural character of the living tradition, 
of which they are the emanation and exponents. The Roman catacombs have acquired great importance as monuments of the earliest tradition. The tradition of a truth being once established, the Catholic has no further interest in the investigation of its continuity, except for the purpose of science and apologetics, because he believes in the divine authority of tradition, and in dealing with Protestants, we may proceed in two ways, either to demonstrate the antiquity of the doctrine, or prove to them the Catholic principles of tradition. With certain limitations, the ordinary preaching of the gospel in parish churches is an important channel of tradition. The fact that the pastor is left in undisturbed possession of his office, that he is in doctrinal communion with his bishop, and, by an apari argument, the bishop is in communion with the Holy Father, the Vicar of Christ, who is in communion with the Holy Spirit of Truth. End of Appendix to Encyclical Letter Pescendi Dominici Gregis On the Errors of the Modernists Section 7 of Pescendi Dominici Gregis On the Errors of the Modernists by Pope St. Pius X Translated by Thomas E. Judge This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Popular Interpretation of the Encyclical For the sake of the general reader, we shall attempt to explain, in the language of the Catechism, the reasons that irresistibly impelled the Holy Father to condemn modernism. Catholics believe that Jesus Christ was both God and man, that, as God, he existed from all eternity, equal to the Father in splendour and power, that he assumed human nature in the womb of Mary, that he wrought many stupendous miracles, that, after having been crucified, he rose again on Easter Sunday and carried his full humanity, after his ascension, into the presence of the Eternal Father. The modernists distinguish between the Christ of history and the Christ of faith. The Christ, who really lived and died, they say was a mere man, the greatest man who ever lived indeed, but with all the limitations of human nature. His miracles, his resurrection and ascension never really occurred, but were credited to him by enthusiastic disciples after his death. Thus the modernists reject the divinity of Christ, which is the cornerstone of the Christian religion. Catholics believe that all the sacraments were instituted by Christ himself. From God alone could they derive their efficacy. No creature could take bread and wine and convert them into the body and blood, soul and divinity of Jesus Christ. The modernists, on the contrary, hold that the sacraments were originated by Christ's disciples. They, nevertheless, in words, maintain that Christ instituted them, because they say, this is an application of their principle of permanence, Christ lives on in his disciples, so that their acts may be attributed to him. Their theory resembles, it seems to us, the positivist idea of the moral immortality of man. A good action influences others to imitate it. The actions of these likewise affect the conduct of others, just as a stone dropped into a lake generates wavelets which excite others until ripple after ripple rises on the surface, the whole body of water being ultimately stirred, however feebly. As a man's life may thus be said to be perpetuated in the surviving influence of his conduct, so the life of Christ is permanent in the lives of his disciples and adherents. This interpretation is merely a base attempt to throw dust in the eyes of Catholics. What men do is men's work, not the personal act of Christ. But the Catholic doctrine is that Christ, in his own person, instituted the seven sacraments, and by his divine power constituted them infallible means of grace. The Church was founded by Christ's own personal act. He gave it its constitution, invested it with plenary authority, and solemnly commanded all men to enter its fold. But the modernists teach that Christians themselves, after Christ's death, voluntarily organized the Church to meet urgent needs of the hour. 
just as Jean-Jacques Rousseau pictures the state springing into existence through a number of individuals pooling their wills and rights into a collectivity, so do these men represent the church as originating in a voluntary compact entered into by the early Christians for the purpose of strengthening and defending their common religious interests. Ecclesiastical authority, disciplinary, dogmatic and liturgical, is therefore derived from the people and answerable to them. The principles from which these doctrines spring were, as we are reminded in the encyclical solemnly condemned by Pius VI, in the bull Altorum Fidei. At various stages in the history of Christianity, when heretics arose to deny some revealed doctrine, the Church solemnly proclaimed the truth and demanded that her children should accept it. Thus the Council of Nice defined that Christ is God, the Council of Ephesus that Mary is the Mother of God, the Vatican Council that the Pope is infallible. All these doctrinal decrees are unchangeable, but the modernists treat them very lightly. Dogmas, they maintain, are merely symbols, useful in certain emergencies, but inevitably destined to become obsolete or ill-adapted to the religious needs of a more advanced progress. Thus the time may arrive, according to their ideas, when it will be inadvisable to believe in the divinity of Christ, or to accord to his blessed mother the honours to which she is entitled by reason of her great prerogative which the Council of Ephesus vindicated. The encyclical emphatically repudiates this perverted view of dogma, and quotes the following constitution of the Vatican Council to show that it was already expressly condemned. The doctrine of the faith which God has revealed has not been proposed to human intelligences to be perfected by them as if it were a philosophical system, but as a divine deposit entrusted to the spouse of Christ to be faithfully guarded and infallibly interpreted. Hence the sense, too, of the sacred dogma is that which our Holy Mother the Church has once declared, nor is this sense ever to be abandoned on plea or pretext of a more profound comprehension of the truth. Catholics hold that the Bible is different from all other books because all its parts were written under the influence and direction of the Holy Spirit, so that it is literally, and not merely figuratively, the Word of God. Modernists, on the contrary, contend that it only embodies the religious experiences of its human authors. Every person has a similar religious experience, or sense of the divine, though not in the same degree. Consequently, the modernists reject the divine authorship of the scriptures in the true sense of the word. The Bible was written by men, under a natural impulse, their mental faculties receiving no stimulus or guidance from any supernatural source. Milton's Paradise Lost, or Dante's Inferno, would possess as clear a claim as the scriptures to be considered inspired, according to the theory of the modernists. The modernists are agnostics, that is, they hold that we cannot know anything except appearances, or the impressions made on our senses. Consequently, they deny that we can acquire any knowledge, properly so called, of God. The mind is everlastingly imprisoned within the circle of its own states, feelings, and impressions. Objects that lie outside of us, our minds cannot reach. All our ideas of a creator, preserver, governor of man and the universe are declared to be empty illusions as far as knowledge is concerned. This principle, the modernists, evidently borrowed from the philosophical system of Kant. The encyclical reminds us that the Vatican Council has defined, if anyone says that the one true God, our Creator and Lord, cannot be known with certainty in the natural light of human reason by means of the things that are made, let him be anathema. And also, if anyone says that it is not possible or not expedient that man be taught through the medium of divine revelation about God and worship to be paid him, let him be anathema. End of popular interpretation of the encyclical letter Pescendi Dominici Gregis End of 
Pescendi Dominici Gregis on the Errors of the Modernists by Pope St. Pius X Translated by Thomas E. Judge Recording by Algie Pug